voice better than anything, and, and he sounds the most important thing. Ever. He was with me in Barcelona. They've all done nationals too. Uh, we've been with you for quite some time. So you're in good hands rule wise um, with the people who are here. <laughs> Thank you. That's my makeup artist. <laughs> yeah. Is this lighting okay? Huh? No, my best light is right here. I mean, <laughs> so today we'll be talking. To <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to roller derby. <laughs> I mean, you're sure to see the factual thing I've ever seen. Right. I know. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> Yesterday I wore one about education. It's like education is important, but roller derby is importanter. Right? And I was just like, uh, okay, here's your teacher who doesn't know how to speak proper English. Um, first and foremost, our, our job as officials is to keep people safe, really. So um, keep the game safe, keep it fair. Uh, other than that, I try to have fun. Uh, internally, I try to have fun with my officials, um, but externally, I try to look professional, especially when you start getting to those higher levels. Um, some of the stuff I talked about yesterday, and this is just, um, it's not in the rules, right? But we shouldn't be smiling. We shouldn't be laughing and joking with other skaters during the game. Um, when it's internal and it's your own league, if that's something you guys want to do, you're more than welcome to, but trying to keep things um, really serious. Um, players will try to make you smile. It's just keep the straight face. You don't have to be an a-hole, but I mean, you're there to do a job. Um, I want to talk about uh, head officials and stuff that I typically do before a game. So I'm not going to cover a lot of the basics just due to time. Um, so we're not going to talk about track setup. We're not going to talk about, okay, well, I'm talking about it right now, uh, pivot line and blocker boxes and, and jammer and jam starts. Um, I want to talk about some more in-depth stuff that I didn't talk about yesterday and then really focus on penalties. Um, I think a lot of the questions are based around penalties, and then I want to leave it open for questions along the way. So if you have questions about penalties or scenarios for those, this is a good time for you guys to get that stuff answered. Um, but if you're head refing, uh, before the game, you know, you should be having a meeting with the, the captain's meeting. During the captain's meetings, typically talk about who's sitting at what bench. Um, are we switching benches at the half? Talk about communication between jams. Uh, my standing on that is if it's a, a quick question, a quick answer, you can come out on the track, you can come out halfway, um, ask the quick question, but if it's anything that's gonna take any amount of time, we have 30 seconds, hey, you're either gonna need to call a timeout, official review, um, a lot of times, Having that communication open up between the coaches to me or the captains to me saves my OPRs, a lot of grief, or my other officials. I also tell them, you know, you are not to talk to any of the other refs except for me as the head ref. Um, and that is unless my scorekeepers are comfortable with them coming to them for point-related questions between the gym. Um, I uh, also talk about uh, what we're doing for gear checks. We talked a little bit about that. Gear checks, um, if we're doing gear checks, usually I do a quick visual, just line up, smile, go through. I don't check pads. I don't check, make sure the knee pads don't slide down. I don't check toe stops. Um, a lot of times we used to in the past, and if you're pulling on skates or if somebody falls, you don't want injuries. So, um, But I'll typically tell the coaches that they're responsible for you know, players are responsible for their gear. If I see you out there without your full gear on, you know, you're going to get a penalty. No, missing a mouth guard, you're going to get a penalty. So make sure you have all your equipment on the track. <coughs> um, with my officials, I talk to my score refs, um, and I tell them to get with, you know, talk to each other, find out who's what color. I tell them who's starting with what team. If I have... Uh, a score ref with one of the home teams um, or if they're from a league that, that, that's playing in that game. I know it's different for interleague. 
I will start the score ref with their team. I try to never let them finish with their team for the sake of, okay, well, we're down, and here, how do I creep points back up? Even though ethics, you know, we shouldn't be doing things like that. I just, I don't want even the other team feeling that way. So um, score refs, if each team brings a score ref, you start with your team, you end with the other team. Um, and I know you can play it the other way too if, if they were trying to cheat or things of give less points, but um, I haven't had it happen. It's just how I try to, to play things when it comes to that. But I tell them to talk to the coaches, introduce themselves to the coaches, introduce themselves to the, the point tracker or the scorekeeper, show how to give the numbers. Um, we, sorry for the, for the people who are here, right? Um, when you talk to your scorekeeper about how you give your numbers, if you're one, two, three, four, five, um, typically say have your scorekeeper mirror those. So if this is three for you, have three from the scorekeeper the same way. If this, this is three, then have three the same way. Um, um, again, we talked about if you're comfortable with them coming out, tell the coach, hey, if it's a quick question or the captain, if it's a real quick points question between jams, feel free to talk to me. If not, deflect them to the head ref. Um, I tell them to talk to each other, you know, false starts. What are we doing for false starts? False starts and USARs, if uh, the jammer is over the line at the start of the jam, you know, you, you call the jam dead. It's their job to call the jam dead. I'm, I'm not looking as a head ref um, what's happening back here. So... Um, you start the da 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 you know, the four, the four whistles on a false start. That jammer goes back 10 feet, and then we quickly start the next jam. You're not waiting another 30 seconds between the jams for that. Um, How many times can they false start? They can false start three times. On the third time, it's the penalty, right? But they false start twice and still play in the jam. Did they not start with the jammer on the third time? Correct. Correct. Um, I talk to the, the score refs for communication. So I always talk to them about lead change situations. Lead change situations, they are, they're talking amongst each other. I talk about um, as they're coming through, I usually tell them if the lead is open or lead is closed. Um, other people will say, uh, open or closed. Um, it just depends on how you're wanting to communicate that. So my score refs don't really have to think as much. If, if they miss a lead, I don't want them to call lead on their next time, you know, the next one comes through who's not lead. And then it's a situation where we have two lead scores and you're having to correct, quickly correct that. And it's confusing for a lot of the people too. Um, when I do talk about lead changes, with score refs, typically the person who's coming up to take the lead is the one who can initiate it. Um, the reason I do this is uh, the lead active scorer ref could be lapping and you're not thinking about, hey, I'm lapping and then the, you get passed by the other active scorer. Am I a lap ahead? Am I not a lap ahead? Whereas the person who's sitting back and not lead, they're like, okay, lap point, they're, they're saying it here. And they should know if they're on the same, um, the same pass. If their uh, active score came out of the box, they're deemed on the same pass at that point, but the other, the other active score ref doesn't think about, oh, they're in the box, okay, they're coming out, oh, they just came out of the box, okay, now they're on the same pass. So it's the, the person who's taking the lead that I, I usually suggest is the one to say lead change, you know, so then they can quickly drop and, and they're right there talking to each other, even though it's, it can be really loud. At least you're next to their ear um, when you're making that change, typically. Okay. That is the gist of, of kind of the pre-game pre-game talk. Um, I, sometimes I talk to my officials about official reviews. Um, official reviews, you don't have to have everybody there with you. Official reviews, captains would come in and alternates, they would tell you what they wanna talk about and then you could bring in your crew. Some people like to have their crew there during the whole thing. 
So you could bring your crew in, okay, great. Does everybody understand the question, you know, with your officials? Yes, we do, okay, great. And then you can go talk about it. Who had eyes, who didn't have eyes? If you didn't have eyes, please go take your position and then you can talk, talk amongst other things like that. So, um, yeah, any questions, pre-game stuff? Can everybody hear me okay volume-wise with the skating? Yeah. Great. So I'm just going to jump right into penalties, um, just due to time. It seems like we always run out of time. So I want to talk about the legal target zone and legal blocking zones. Um, this is uh, for any of the impact penalties. Um, ref, can I borrow you again for this? Uh, legal target zones is where can I as a blocker hit somebody else? So I'm targeting my opponent and where can I legally hit them on their body? So legal target zones is shoulders to mid thighs. This includes the arms, the hands, um, includes the torso, uh, the front, all the way until um, mid back. So uh, I typically will say like bra straps down, all the way down. This is the back block area. Um, what's important about this is you are able to hit the arm, you're able to hit hands. Um, compared to where can I block with my body, uh, if, if I am initiating a block against this target zone, I'm able to block from shoulders to mid thighs, but only down about here on my arm, right? Out here would be elbow, forearm, hands, even though it's hand, just called hands, forearm and hands. So I could come into his hand with my hip, but if I were to bring my hand into his hip, it's, it's different, right? But I can also block with my back. So even though I can't hit the back, I could still come straight into him with my back. Um, I can push completely with my spine if I wanted to. Um, however, if I stopped right here and he came into my back, well, then he's initiating that hit, right? So just for the sake of where you can hit and what you can hit with, and then it breaks down to what is the impact if I hit somewhere that I'm not supposed to hit. And this is what is really iffy amongst a lot of officials. Um, even if you see a back block, so if I were to, see with the camera, right? If I were to come into the back, um, coming in hot, I'm the jammer or the lead active scorer, and I hit right here, but he doesn't budge, even though I made contact into the back, there was no impact to him or the, the person I'm hitting, so it doesn't mean it's a back block penalty. Um, another situation is if I come in with my shoulder and my shoulder makes that impact where it pushes him away and you see my arm come up, even if you see daylight, you see things, was it my arm that's pushing, that's really creating more oomph, or was it my shoulder that hit and my arm just kind of followed. And if you don't know if which one is which, the right call is to not call a forearm or a hands penalty or, or an elbow, right? A lot of times you may not know if it's an elbow or a hands. I just see this arm coming up. Well, it was close to the elbow. Is that a forearm? Really, it doesn't matter if it's a penalty. You should call it. And if you say elbow and it was hands, it's not a big deal, right? Um, but what's important is being able to tell where that impact happened. Um, a lot of the questions yesterday was, was around daylight. Um, and it's really hard to tell. You know, I made my little jokes yesterday of, did you see the muscles flexing? You know, did you see veins popping as I'm pushing? It, you know, you're not gonna see that stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's difficult, but what I, typically see is um, you're going to see somebody really get launched, um, but they can get really launched by a shoulder. They can get really launched with a hip and arms just happen to come out. But if that arm stays on that body for a while, instead of just this little wing that pops up, this chicken wing, um, that's when I would typically call it as it, as it maintains contact out a decent amount. Um, just a little pop or something I, I don't call unless unless I can see that, oh, well, there wasn't much there and they're just pushing with an arm, 
you know, those are pretty obvious. Uh, but again, uh, I'm a pretty lenient ref. I don't like to, um, well, I won't guess. If I'm guessing on anything, I'm not making a call. Um, but I also don't want to take away from the game. So if both, hand, if both teams are, are kind of really all out here and it's not, uh, it's not like a world game or the championship game, it's like how many little tiny calls, oh, forearm, 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 oh, hands, hands, you know, you're taken away from the game. Really, it's not being an advantage for anybody. Um, the other thing is uh, impact base, it's really easy when it's down and out, right? It's not always going to be down or out. But if I came in with my arm and I hit like this, if he goes, you don't have to fall, but if he goes out of bounds, it's obvious that I hit with my forearm or I hit him in the back and he went out, he just lost his position. So down and out is an easy call on an illegal hit. Um, the other thing is advantage. So I may, I may hit in the middle of the back, he pops forward a couple inches, well, well he lost his position. Well, he did, but he didn't. Um, I didn't pass, nothing else happened a good no call on that hit. But he hit me right in the back. What if as you, put, you make contact with him, you don't necessarily pass him, but you pass one of his teammates, gaining position yeah. by pushing him out? Yeah, so, Would you then call so that if, one in? He, yes. Okay. So if he's, a, if, if he's in a wall, and I hit him enough to where he goes uh, two inches, which gives me leeway to now that he's up by a back block two inches, that I could just gain, gain an advantage for me, that would be a back block, okay? Um, the other thing is if it loan and I hit him and, and I am able to gain because of this just off him, I'm able to gain a position. He just lost his position. So I gain an advantage from an illegal hit. That would be a back block, yeah. Um, this rule set's really fast. So it's not typically... Uh, it's a hard one to determine because it goes so fast, but it's yeah. good to have that understanding. Yeah. And because we're going so fast, um, you can get hit and pop forward uh, six inches, eight inches, a foot, but, but really, was there any advantage gained from that illegal hit? Um, if this person was riding that 10-foot lane and I hit him in the back, and he popped forward two inches, what, which caused him to go out of play. That is another scenario. So not just down or out, but now he went out of play. He just lost his position. Um, that would also be a back block. <coughs> okay. I have a question um, regarding jammers and forearms. Do we have some jammers that get caught behind a back wall and they tend to do this for some reason? But then they end up in the box for doing a forearm, even though they haven't gained position. They're yeah. just feeling. They're just right now. Really okay. So, so the question, just for the, the, the camera and everything else here too, um, you have a jammer uh, who's very feely, a feely jammer, touchy, or just skates out here like this um, and gets forearm calls. Um, this is exactly what we've been talking about, right? So, uh, the fact that my forearm, my hands, I'm touching. Um, have I gained an advantage or have they lost their position? So if they have not, there's, it's, it's an easy no call. There's a lot of people who skate by feel, right? Even if this is my opposing team, I'm still here. I need to know, you know, where is this person at? But I'm looking at what's happening behind me. Um, this person, if this person is me, I like to swat hands a lot. Like, quit touching me. <laughs> You know, I skate backwards too, but if your hands on me, I'm like, <laughs> don't touch me, you know? Um, on the flip side of your question, if you're skating out here, right, and my arms are here and all of a sudden this person falls, I mean, who knows why they fall, right? Or maybe, maybe there was a, a, a little extra push and they got off balance, that, that's going to be the call. Now, if they flop, you know, and a ref sees that they flop, that would not be a call. Um, when we were doing that zombie game, we tried not to call them as much on it as say, watch your forearms, right. so that they didn't 
give themselves too many opportunities to then give impact. It's like, well, just just don't rest like this if you're trying to get through a wall. It's not going to get you through. The, like, the, just the Kirby Mantis there. pose? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it was, the, it was the, the angry T-Rex, but like yeah. the, a lot of people <laughs> rest like their arms like on their backs as they're trying to push through the packs. So we're trying to keep, make people break that habit. You know, we've got a lot of newer skaters that like, they spend stuff that they don't want to make that initial like contact with their shoulders so they come in like yeah. Yeah. People call me a T Rex. I, I skate like this. I mean, <laughs> this is just me because, doing because doing I'm I'm just back, I think yeah I'm not yeah. It, but I have my T Rex arms you know like little. Hey, you don't want a forearm. You're just keeping right. them here. Right. Right. Um, so if you're a skater and and you're hearing what I'm saying and you're like oh gosh they've been calling it just because. I'm, I'm telling you how it should be, doesn't mean that's how things are going to be called, right? So it's the perspective of whatever official is seeing it, ref, the, the, the ref that's seeing it, and if they believe that that caused something, your job is to accept the penalty. Your job is not to argue with the ref. Your job is to yell at your captain or coach, your alternate, and be like, this is bull, you know, um, and let them deal with it, right? It's not going to help you to to yell at an official and be like, there was no impact, this, and they're, oh, you're right, let me retract my call. <laughs> really? Yeah, I doubt that. Um, and it's just gonna give you a second penalty. You know, it's gonna give you an insubordination, um, or if you keep on, they're gonna kick you out. So, question about insubs? Uh, question about, in general, things on the track. So, one of the things that I was on a team that tried to call things for the team, and if the refs happen to overhear it, great. It's like, we have a baby, where the pack, we have a baby, where the pack. It's like, that, if you're yelling that on the track, would the refs perceive that as us trying to like tell them where pack definition is? No. Or is that okay? Because it's communication. Yeah, so the question is, if you're a, a player and you're saying, hey, we have pack, and sorry, I'm just, yeah. for the camera, since we don't have mics out there, um, I'm a player on the track. And I'm saying, hey, we've got pack. Pack is here. Pack, we're the pack. Oh, that was a forearm. Or oh, back block. I, no, I know, but I'm all these things, right? It's your right. You're not looking and saying, come on, ref, that's a back block, okay. right? I'm looking at the floor. Oh man, this sucks. Or that was stupid, right? Well, what's stupid? I don't know, right? If you're trying to justify your behavior, um, that's okay. And and what I mentioned in the other sessions is. It's the captain, it's the coach's job, the alternate players to get refs to side with them or for them or if you can get them to call a penalty, why, even if it didn't exist, why wouldn't you want that, right? It's our jobs as a ref to not care what they're saying and, and to call it as we see it, right? right? I mean, I, I can be looking at you as a jammer who's going like this to me. I'm calling it! I'm calling it! And I'm just staring at you stupidly because, am I pointing at you? No. You're not, you're not lead, right? Or maybe you are, but you're on the floor. And you're flopping, and I'm just like, I'm not, it's not my job to coach you. Right? So I shouldn't be saying, oh, you need to be upright and in bounds to call it. Right? Uh, and if I do call it, this is also another contention. If I do call it, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to call it for you, and now I'm going to give you a penalty. penalty it was a false call. Right? Well, but ref, that was your fault. You shouldn't have called it. I can do this all I want. You should get the penalty because you messed up and called it. Well, no. You messed up and tried to get me to call it, and I went for it. Yeah. I have to buy these guys beers afterwards because I made a mistake. I screwed up. Yeah. You know, but... Especially as we have like newer players, because pack definition can change, I wanted to make sure it's not an issue of like we have a bunch of people who's like, I have, I have a baby, we're the pack, you know, like if we yeah. shout those things that it's not inhibitive. Yeah, and that, that's fine because okay. you, you could be wrong, right? And I'd be like, wow, you're wrong, and guess what? Keep hitting them because there's yeah. a penalty for you. Why? We're pack. No, you're not. You thought anyway, you were. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the baby you have has a star on the helmet. Yeah, they don't define that. So. Oh gosh, that happens quite a bit. They're like, yeah. oh, stinky. Can we go into more of the legal call-offs on what all that consists of and what, sure. what the, we kind of discussed yesterday? Yeah, so uh, this came up in, in both the other sessions, illegal call-offs. Uh, as an active scorer, 
there are certain things that are required for you to be able to call off the jam. Let me just say as a jammer, you cannot call off the jam. Okay? So in this rule set, you have two jammers. Until a jammer becomes an active scorer, right? they're not able to call off the jam. And until that active scorer actually becomes the lead active scorer, they're not able to call off the jam. Okay? Um, when you're the lead active scorer, and this is really who, um, you still need to be able to, the easy way to say it, even though it's not how it's worded, is you have to be, you score a point. So until the lead active scorer passes an opposing blocker on a scoring pass, they are not allowed to call off the jam. Legally pass them on the track, get that point, right? Um, there are weird stipulations like a point's been given, there's a lead change, well that person hasn't scored, but there's still a point, can they call it off? Um, but for this scenario, I, I kind of want to talk about what makes that eligibility. Um, other rule sets will be, hey, I'm 10 feet away from the pack and I'm calling it off, it's a race, or I'm halfway around and I'm tapping. Uh, the second tap is what really determines when the call off should happen. Um, they have to be upright, inbounds, score that point, if you want to think about it, and then that second tap, inbounds, upright, even if they right then fall, even if they right then go out of bounds, they got two before they went out, initiates that call off. The call off, da 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 We could talk about whistles if we really want to. Um, I talked about them before. Um, that first whistle of the four set, the, the first whistle of the three sets, sorry, um, is what stops that lead changes. So it's very important that you as a scorer ref, as soon as that second tap happens, bup, that first bup stops any kind of lead changes. And that's, that, that happens even if you hear lead change. That first whistle negates all of it and you continue and the jam is dead. Um, the illegal call off portion, uh, I've heard a lot of people disagree with, right? Um, why am I getting a penalty for a mistake from the ref? Or why isn't it a penalty for somebody to tap their hips twice and try to call it off when they can't? Um, my answer to that is um, it's not a penalty because there's no impact. So if I'm sitting here like this, as an active scorer trying to call it off, but a ref isn't doing anything about it, what's the impact to the game? Right? I'm skating around, I'm calling it, I'm calling it, I'm calling it, I'm calling it. And the coach, they're calling it! They're calling it! Right? I don't care. They're not eligible to call off. There's still no impact. Maybe I'm pissing off people and, and the crowd's boo, boo, what is this guy doing? Get this ref out of here, right? Um, but if I did call it, there is impact to the other team, right? They shouldn't have been able to call it off. We should have had a lead change. We, we were right there. We would have got four points because of the way everything's running. Um, so the penalty, the impact to the game is if it gets called incorrectly. And the only reason it got called incorrectly is because you're doing this, right? So an illegal call off penalty, even though it's a, an official mistake, you're the one who's trying to make them make that mistake. Um, and you may purposely be trying to do it. And we, we can't judge intent. Does that also include like if the ref starts, if they only get one tap, in and they like go out of bounds or fall down and there's a lead change but the ref is already calling it off after the first tap. Is that still an illegal call off because they didn't get two taps in before they went to yep. So the question is, uh, let's say uh, I am the lead active scorer and I'm tapping it off, I get one tap and I'm like a slow tapper and, or even a fast tapper, and before I get the second tap my foot goes out of bounds and I get the second tap or uh, I fall before I get that second tap 
and the lead, the, the, act, the score ref calls it off. Pop, 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 um, Yes, that would be an illegal call off if it was caught. And I'll say if it was caught, you know, then it's like, they were down, they, were, they went out of bounds before they got the second tap, official review or whatever. Or it could be as simple as the score ref's like, oh, hey, they didn't get the second. Yeah, okay, okay. I'll give, okay, I'll give them the penalty. Right, the weight of the world's on their shoulders. They made a mistake, you see it. Um, and it happens. So uh, two taps, upright, inbounds, before it's called. A dispute in our league about preloading people coming into the pack. You know, we've got a lot of flappers that come into the pack and they're already flapping as they're trying to pass. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, uh, so preloading uh, is somebody who's uh, other rule sets. It's like you are already tapping because you want them to start the cadence before you pass because you want points. You can get those points before somebody else. Um, or in this rule set, Hey, I'm calling it, I'm calling it because you want them to start calling it as soon as you get that point. Uh, is it two taps it's, past the hips? Yep. It is. Your, your first opposing player? Yeah, so, so I can tap twice, get the point, and tap, and stop. It's still not a legal call off until the second tap. And hopefully they didn't call it off. Yeah. Right? Um, if they did, you know, it's, it's not illegal. If they did call it off, it, that would not be an illegal call off. It just, it's a mistake, right? It should not have been called because it's two taps after you've got that point, right? So you can tap all you want. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. I get hit. Well, I get that point, but I stop tapping. I'm not calling it off. Okay. Yeah. You can preload all you want, but it still has to be two, two, two taps on the hip. Pass yeah, two point. taps. Yeah, preloading, what preloading can do is let me know as your scorer ref that, oh, yeah, you're trying to call, you're going to call it, so as soon as you get that, I know, and I can call it's it. It's a signal. Know. Right, right. Um, but it so happens, like, I'm just saying it because we get preloaders, and they only get yep. one head before they get, you yep. know, and then they get hit out of bounds or whatever, sure. and then they're still flapping around and going, why didn't you call? Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. So the preload doesn't count, yeah. Yeah, it's just alerting me you're wanting me to call it when when it's legal for me to call it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, good questions. Any other questions around call-offs? I know it's a, a lot of contention here. Yeah. It's just a, it's a little, it's a, it was a gray zone for us, and it's very clear now. What do you consider hands to the hips? Yeah, you know, like, yeah. I tried to call it off once, and I couldn't get my arms down because people were blocking me, so... Yeah, I mean, so I'm, to do this. I'm, I'm not a, a, a jerk about it. I know if, if you're calling it, like, if you're doing this, I'll let you know, I'll, I'll probably call it for you, because I can see, but I would let you know, please try to make it a little bit bigger. Yeah. Because if you're in a, I can't, maybe sometimes I can't see them, yeah. right? So if you're doing this, um, some people will do this, which is fine. It's just, it takes you longer to get there, right? If your arm is caught and you're trying to do whatever, if you're like up here and you're like, I'm calling it or whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm going to call it for you. Maybe you can't get your hands down because, uh, well, I'm, uh, get one hand to the hip, you know. <laughs> Technically, it's two hands, it's the hips, two taps to the hips to call it. Um, Again, if it's, if it's, well, if you're smacking your booty, that's fine. Yeah. 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 I mean, if we wanted to get super technical, the rules say to the hips. Um, if you're at a world thing and there's some, hey, official review, it's a legal call off, you know, they were tapping their helmet, the rules, okay, if, if we want to get that. Okay, thank you. We're gonna. We have a lot of very short skaters in our league, and sometimes they get swallowed in the middle of the pack and can be calling off as big as they can, and it can't be seen. Do you have any suggestions for visit for increasing their visibility? Okay. So the question is, is if you have um, 
shorter, smaller, it doesn't really matter. Anybody who's kind of gobbled up in this, this pack of how to see them or how to make it more visible, aud audible, right? Um, me as a scorer ref, I am I'm down here, I'm all over trying to get eyes on my active scorer. Um, my sole job is to be looking at this person. So even if they're, they're gobbled up, I mean, I, I can be down here looking and I'm, I'm on the line. So we talked about this in earlier sessions, like uh, active score or score refs should be on that line or closer to the line so they're not behind another ref trying to see. Um, audible, I'm calling it, I'm calling it. That's why you'll also hear this stuff, but I'm calling it, and if I can see kind of movement, I'm, I'm calling it for him. Um, okay, so as a scorer ref, what is like your main responsibility? Because like if you're looking at their hips, maybe you're not paying attention to their feet and where they are in yeah. bounds. Yep. So is your priority to make sure that they're upright in bounds as they're calling it, or is it to call it off? Okay, so great question. As a scorer ref, what's your responsibility? So let me, I'll, I'll answer your question um, to calling it off. Um, I should be able to see everything you're doing from my position. So I'm not like focused in like a hawk on your hands and your hips to see if you're calling it. Um, my job as a scorer ref is my active scorer or my jammer, what they're doing and what people are doing to them. Okay, so are you making legal hits? Are they making legal hits on you? Are you... Are your hips passing their hips um, for points? You know, what, where are the points? Who have you passed already? If you get swallowed up, who haven't you passed, right? Because you could pass the same person twice, and I'm like, oh, that's the fourth. Oh, no, that's not the fourth. That's, you know, you, you pass these people, and okay, they're still the pivot up front you haven't passed. You still haven't got that fourth point. You went to the box. Okay, I need to remember why you're in the box and I'm staring at you. You have three points. I still have the three points here. Okay, you haven't passed the pivot yet or you haven't passed uh, black one, two. Okay, um, there's lots of things that you need to be thinking about. Um, if I see that, as a head ref, if I see that my scorer refs are missing trips, oh man, they're kicking her feet, or missing going over the lines, you know, I may ask them to back off the line a little bit. Um, to try to change their spectrum, or if I see they're missing high blocks, man, yeah, there's a there's a black one two in reverse on her cheek. You know, um, I didn't see the hit. Did you see it? No, I didn't see how it got there. Okay, well maybe instead of focusing on cuts and staring at the feet, maybe start staring at you know the knees or the hips so you can see more of a spectrum of what's happening or maybe back off the line so you get just a little bit more of a view. It's tough, you know, and, and if, if you're a skater, you know, I, I would say one day at a scrimmage, try to ref. Just so you can see what it's like to be a ref because it's really easy when you're one of 10 skaters on the track knowing that, oh, he just pushed me with his arm. Oh, I'm sorry, where are you? Oh, there you are. Yeah, well, sorry, I was looking up here with what was happening here at the time in that one second that it happened, right? I mean, it's um, a lot of times, and I'm sorry if you're a skater and I missed a high block. I didn't see it and I'm not calling it, even though you told me, even though your nose is bleeding, <laughs> even though you've got a number on your face in reverse of, an opposing skater and I can see the smudge on their arm. I don't know if you headbutted their arm, if, if you punched yourself in the face, if you picked a booger and there was a scab. I don't know, I'm sorry, but unless you see it, it's a no call, right? Great question. I got it. Um, okay, so the question is, uh, calling off a jam, what happens on each individual beep of a whistle to end the jam? Um, skaters are taught, man, you skate through that fourth whistle of the first set. So calling it off, I'm just going to say whistles, there's a cadence, 
and I'm a, a, I get picky if people are off on their cadence, and then I just say, don't, don't, don't call it off unless you can jump on one of the things. Um, clean whistles is good, but the cadence, um, I'm just going to grab my whistle as an example. So a call off. So four, pause, four, pause, four, pause. Um, the only thing that really matters is the first four whistles, bop, 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 bop. The other ones are to relay because not everybody's going to hear what, what, what's happening. So it's just that relay to let everybody know the jam's done. Um, the first whistle of the first set, so one of four, stops lead changes. Okay, so immediately there's not a lead change, there's nothing else. The fourth whistle of that first set stops points. Okay, so you get points up to the fourth, dot, 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 but the lead change, you know, that race to try to get past the hips is the first. Okay, um, there can still be argument amongst score refs about lead change or not lead change. If those four whistles, bop, 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 you know, and everybody's calling it, you're not going to be like, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, jam's on, jam's on. I mean, the, the damage has already been done if there's been damage. So at that point, the jam is dead, and then you can argue amongst each other of, well, was there a lead change? Did they get the two taps before they went by? Was it that first whistle where you just really slow and you didn't get it? Well, it's the first whistle of the fir first set which stops lead changes. So that could cause an illegal call off, right? If there was a lead change and now the non-active scorer called it off, that's a penalty. So to answer your question about, yeah, push it through to the fourth because that's points. Yeah. Question two, if a skater is um, perfectly eligible and maybe like an official just, the sword ref just didn't have their whistle in their mouth and didn't get it there in time, is there, it's on the whistles, not on the legal call off, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Technically it's the first whistle of the first set. So if they like don't, if they're like slow at whistle. Yeah, it, 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 can, it can make things really interesting, and then you're going to be like, well, we're going to change the rules um, to be the second tap. I mean, the second tap is really what it is, and then you have a lazy or somebody who doesn't have things ready, and then they're like, this is an illegal call-off. Um, you know, head ref discretion. Hey, sorry, they got the two taps. It was slow on ours. I'm not, and that's how it's going to be called the entire game. Okay. Right. So... <coughs> So depending on how tight you guys are wanting to play, you know, down to the periods of the sentences, I mean, whatever. Anything you guys want to add to any of the stuff I've said? Okay. I want to expand on a little bit of something you said about uh, when you're talking about a score ref and, you know, you find yourself in a position where it's like, okay, well, I'm... Just it, yeah. If you find yourself as a score ref and you find yourself in a position, well, oh, they have that bloody nose, they have that number on their face, and this applies to a ref in any position. If you see that, okay, well, I saw the results of an action, I don't know what that action was, probably a penalty, put yourself in a position to see it better next time. Um, if, you're an, if you're an OPR on the outside and you're off skates and you're like, you know, it's always happening over here, you know what, move yourself over and look. One of the things uh, as a front IPR a lot is the multiplayer blocks. When all of a sudden I start seeing a lot of links happening, I pull myself up and closer so I can look down and see when a link gets challenged. If I'm sideways with it, I can't tell if the link's being challenged. So as a ref, if you find yourself in situations, it's like uh, a perfect one would be like the, the uh, uh, jammer. Well, the jammer is constantly being called for cut, for, for, for cut reset by, from the outside. Okay, maybe I need to focus more on like like Ryder said, pull myself back and trying to get a full spectrum of the body, not just focus on the hips or the heads or something like that. So it's being able to, when you start seeing actions that happen that you're missing, adjust your position to see if you can see that full action better next time. It's just trying to keep everybody safe. Yeah. 
That's good. Uh, when I started, I was missing uh, a lot of high blocks. That was just me. Um, I, I loved being a jammer ref. That's all I ever wanted to do when I was refing. Um, I like skating. Um, and I found that I needed to adjust my hey, points happen at the hip. Taps happen at the hip. I need to make sure cuts. I need to make sure all this. So I'm, I'm always here like watching and I'm missing what's happening up here. So being able, like I said, just shift or back up so you can see more of what's happening. Can we touch on um, if my scorer cuts on the outside and I don't see it, but the outside ref is trying to call them on a yield, they come back in and call it off and I don't realize they're doing that and I call sure. it? Sure, thank you. Yeah, um, so this scenario will, um, it could be inside, outside. Uh, if there is a cut track yield assigned to an active score, and then we'll go into more that exact scenario. Uh, a cut track yield does not make them eligible for calling it off. Right? So if I have to, if I do a cut penalty, like other rule sets, uh, there is a cut track yield. So color, number, there's no whistle on a cut track yield. Um, color, number, Red, five, two, cut, yield. Um, that means they need to remove themselves from the track, let the pack go by, and then hop back in and go. Um, if I make that and there's a cut track yield and I'm tapping and it gets called, that is not a legal call off and there would be a penalty assigned to that. Okay. This particular scenario is a little bit different. Um, in that, the first scenario I was talking about, I know there's a cut track yield, I'm the scorer ref, and I'm calling it, I'm probably not, I better not, otherwise I need training, right? Um, but we all make mistakes, so just because somebody makes a mistake, don't. Thank you for officiating, thank you for refing, we need you. Even if you make mistakes, we need you, right? Um, so love your non-skating officials and your refs. Um, but in that scenario, we know there's a cut track yield, so it's different. Um, in the scenario brought to us, an outside pack ref uh, calls a cut track yield on my active score, my lead active score, um, who is calling it off, and I call it off. I didn't see the cut track yield, I call it off. Okay? Immediately, the other team, the bench that's right by that OPR, hey, she shouldn't have been able to call it off! Right? Um, official review. Okay, we have an official review. Um, I would then, okay, thank you, I understand. Yep, okay, and then I talk to, all right, my outside pack ref, my score ref. Okay, what did you guys see? Um, my score ref says to me, um, I saw the whole thing. I don't feel they went out. Um, I saw the feet on the outside, so I called it. My outside pack ref is, I'm right there. I saw her foot go over or their foot go over. I said the yield. They called it anyways. Okay, thank you. So now I'm in a tight spot of who overrules who, right? And um, I hate to say it. I would think about what's the skill level of my officials, um, my scorer ref. They had eyes the whole time. They're watching. If they feel that the person was in, I would probably lean to that they're in, right? Um, if my score ref said something different, you know, it was, it, I, I don't know. You know, they were out there, I was watching the hips coming through. I did not hear the cut track yield. Um, they were tapping, I called it. My outside pack ref says, no, I, I was right there. I tried to quickly call the penalty, get this, you know, the hand signal up and get the attention of my score. Okay, well, then that's a penalty. They called it. Hey, I know you didn't hear. I'm sorry. The fact is it happened, and that would be uh, an illegal call off. Does that help? Yes. What if Thank nobody you. does the official review? What if they, like, the coach doesn't ask for it? Shouldn't we as refs still have that conversation? So, yeah, so. It, it, would be, it would be super quick, right? So in that scenario, uh, the OPR might come in at the end of the jam and be like, um, uh, I called a cut track yield. They went out. I'm like, did you see? I, I don't know. I, I, uh, right. It has to happen so quick 
that you have to make that decision, and if you don't make a decision, then you err on, I, I don't know. And what do you do if you don't know? There's a no call. If you don't know, it's a no call. Because you don't want to... But if your ASR is like, oh yeah, I couldn't see the feet. Yeah, yeah. If, if it's that quick, it's the same scenario. Without an official review, they're like, it's an illegal call off. Okay, well, go own it. Right? Is OPR not all that heavily after the fact? There's, so, so the question, well, the penalty would be an illegal call off. That's not the OPR to call an illegal call. That's, that's my score ref. Right. The OPR to go right. I mean, they should come in and be like there was a cut warning. So the other thing is, uh, a lot of times there are a cut warning, and it gets called off, and that skater didn't leave the track before it got called off. There's no penalty. So a lot of people will be like, well, they didn't yield that cut cut yield, right? They they didn't yield. Well, they didn't have time to yield, and it's not a penalty until they don't yield, right? So just because there's a, a warning or a yield out there doesn't mean at the end of the jam that they're going to get assigned a penalty. I think what this brings up is our, like we talked about yesterday, our rate is insanely loud. Yeah. And you cannot always hear inside to outside when somebody's right. trying to call. Especially so if there's this, no whistle. Yeah. That's the big thing, is if there's no whistle, it's very hard to, yeah. to hear a filter. Right. Yeah. So, so the contract yields are especially Yeah. Hard. So I mean, Every scenario is different. Yeah. I would suggest if I was the OPR, quickly come in and say, hey, this happened. I'm certain this happened. I mean, I saw the foot went out. It was an illegal call off. Let that, let that talk happen. The other thing that's important about this is we talked in other sessions about positioning, right? As OPRs, where should you try to be? I, I know it's hard when there's two active scorers sometimes, but you, you should be trying to position yourself kind of where the jammer is in the pack as your section. Um, if you're positioning yourself directly across, because me as an active scorer ref, if I have any questions, I'm looking up at you. I'm still being able to see my jammer, but um, was that a cut? Are they okay? I'm waiting for you to make, make that response to me of, that's good, it's good. Um, one thing I talked about before is no thumbs up. Don't, don't get in the habit of thumbs up. You know, if I'm looking up at you and you're like, right, we don't want a picture of you with the thumbs up with somebody hurt in the background or, or anything. Um, it's funny to think about, but you know it's happened and that's what sucks is, oh, who's this ref smiling or laughing and like, hey, and there she is with a broken leg. Um, uh, so no thumbs up, no okays. Um, a lot of times, and that's the initial talk, is all I need you to do is, is confirm. If you just give me a nod, I know things are fine because if they're not fine, you're not going to say no. You're going to say cut, right? You're going you're gonna to give me a hand signal. If there's a penalty with a whistle, that's easy. Cuts are the hard ones. Throw the symbol, right? So if, we, if the OPR sees it, they should be throwing it up because that visual might help over the din of the noise. Yeah. We, yeah, we, we just get better. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to say they should be throwing it up because that could be nasty on the track. Well, but maybe just putting a signal. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> nothing like too intense out there, you know. <laughs> no, but if, if we do hand signals, especially above the helmet, that will help with how loud. Absolutely. So that, that's where the nod to me is everything's fine, and you're seeing me questioning, right? You're just acknowledging, yep, we're good. Um, doesn't need to be a thumbs up. If it's not good, you don't need to nod. You need to throw, throw me some gang signs, right? Right? Here it is. <laughs> Scratching your chin. You know, whatever you're wanting to do. Yeah. Okay. Good questions. Um, can I pass it? To you, D, just to, for more interaction to you guys. You want to go through all the hand signals? Cut inside. <laughs> all right, so we're going to start with uh... a. <laughs> uh, please give them your good side. <laughs> are you are you good going through all this stuff? I just you know want to, you guys have been here the whole time. Um, so what we have not done here, I'll, I'll just keep this on. Um, what we have not done yet is going through all the different penalties. So in case there's any questions of penalties. So um, 
for the sake of conversation, we've already been talking about cut track. So um, a cut track symbol looks like, um, great. And the, the verbal cues for a cut track symbol would be, uh, we're just going to say, let's see, my number is 65 now, or 21. What's easier to say, 21? 65, 65. Um, so black 65 is going to be me. So if you were to issue me a, I'm not even going to say anything, if you were to issue me a cut, how would you issue me black 65 a cut? Tweet. Uh, no tweet. Because, yeah, well, this, there's, there are penalties, but we're going to start, I'm sorry, I should, I should have said, yeah, so we're going to start with, with, a, with a yield, and I'm sorry. I should clarify. My bad. So black 65. Are you going to answer it? Good. So uh, she's looking for you guys too. So oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So what's important is black six five, yeah. right? It's not black sixty five. Black six five. So say each number black six five, cut yield. Okay. So yield is kind of you're showing them there. Okay. If that person does not yield, it's okay. Black six five, cut yield. You don't have to keep doing this. You know, black six five, cut yield. If they look at you, you could be like, <laughs> right? Never say like black jammer, or like if they don't hear no. their number. Okay. No, no. So I would numbers. be like, mama, hey, <laughs> right? No, black six five, cut yield. Um, I could give them another warning. Black six five, right? Uh, if if they're looking, I could you know mm -hmm. quickly. Um, other than that, then it would be a penalty, because. I have, excuse my language here, I have shit to do, <laughs> right? I'm not spending my time on you. There's so much other stuff going on. I gave you a chance. Now you're getting it, right? So then you get, you got a whistle? No. Black, six, five, cut. Oh, just Yep. Yeah, because that's your penalty. So now you've got, you've got the cut, OK? Because you're not yielding anymore. Yeah. Now you got it. OK? Yeah. And if you continue, I, I'm not going to blow the whistle again. Black, six, five, cut. Yeah. Right? All right, now you're pissing me off. <laughs> right? Black, six, five, insubordination. Insub. So now you've got two. When they look at me, oh. that's two. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Two. Yeah. Now I'm going back to business. <laughs> right? Um. Okay. Real quick tip on the cut track hand signal, especially for the over enthusiastic new refs that see it and want to call it. Uh, from experience, if you start calling that hard and fast, you're going to wake up the next day and then go, why are my forearms bruised? Uh, oh, if you're don't hitting yourself. Don't bone on bone. Yeah. Turn one so you get a meat fleshy part of your wrist. That's right. And you don't smack. Now, uh, yeah, for experience refs, we're all calm, so we're probably like, hey. But that doesn't happen. I yep. still end up with bruises all over my forearms from falling. So just be mindful of that. Don't hurt yourself. Okay. Uh, no more insubs for the demonstration. You've already seen insubordination. Okay. Uh, back lock. So black six five. We got. Oh, it's so wonderfully. The, the camera's gonna love that. So black six five. Back lock. Okay. Thank you. Please keep doing it. Uh, elbow. I'm not gonna whistle anymore. I see. Um, yeah. So uh, we're gonna do elbow. Black, six, five. Okay. Uh, hands slash forearms, right? So it's really a hands penalty, even if it's the forearms. So beep, black, six, five. Elbow, I mean forearm. Hands, but it's hands. It's hard to switch, right? You're like forearms. Well, they, but they were put, yeah, it's hands. Hands, okay. Um, high block. Black, six, five. High block. I know, that's how I right. remember 
Exactly, a face mask. Like, hey, you've got that. It, they got hit in the face, right? Um, low block. Boop. Black, 6-5. Low block. Okay. And that's not me blocking somebody. Okay. Just for the people who I'm low rider, sorry. I got it. I know, thank you. <laughs> but you it was a groaner. <laughs> oh, man. Who's this guy? Uh, multiplayer. Beep. Black, 6-5. Multiplayer. Multiplayer, it's okay if you're here to whatever to, to for visibility. Um, out of bounds blocking. Beep. Black, 6-5. Blocking out of bounds. Okay. Outside, inside. Mm -hmm. Okay, out of play blocking. Beep. Black six five or four two or whatever number. Two digits. Okay. Illegal procedure. Beep. Color number penalty. I'll stop whistling. Illegal procedure. All right. Yeah. No. I will always do the symbol, and if I have to point, I point. And I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm not pointing at somebody. I'm I'm signaling them to the box. Yeah. Right. So it's not like a high block. Right. It's more of high block. Go to the box. Right. Um, misconduct. So first, misconduct could be hitting somebody with both feet off the ground, like you're jumping, apex jumping into somebody. It could be a misconduct. It could be um, you saying, F you, you're an idiot, to my official, right? Sorry, you're in stripes, so you're my, right? Right, so misconduct. Yeah. You did. Scratch my teeth, you did. <laughs> That's it, do it again. I dare you. No. Uh, we've already done in sub, we've done cutting the track, uh, skating out of bounds. Which way do they. Right? Um, we did out of play blocking, but how about just out of play? So, is there a whistle for being out of play? No, there's no whistle for being out of play, right? But, out of play, and if you're on the outside, you're over here, right? Depending on which side you are. Did I miss any? We got the rule book there, I think. I just went through all my uh, penalties. I think that's all. Pardon me? Direction. So... Skating out of bounds, cutting the track out of play, yeah. A direct direction of play. Did I not say it's right there in my notes? Okay. Direction of play. Flip flopping. Excellent player and return to your hands. Okay. It's direct help yeah. the same as like stopping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, some of the things, I'm just looking, where are we at on time? We're doing okay. This is good. It's been been some good chatting. Um, stopping on the track is is something that um, gets called a lot, and it's a stupid penalty. Meaning, a lot of times you look at them and you're like, oh, "I'm sorry, but you did it. I know that was stupid, but you did it, uh, and you're not allowed to do it." Um, so there's only a few reasons why you're allowed to stop on the track. Okay, one of which is if you're recovering from a block, you're allowed to stop on the track. Okay, so if, if you hit somebody and you come to a stop or you're hit and you're like, whoa, and I just stopped, that's okay. Okay, you're allowed to stop on the track if you're changing direction. So, you know, the step-step thing. So, um, 
maybe I, I, I'm sitting here and I, oh, I need to go forward, so I, I go forward. It's okay to stop while I change direction. Temporarily stop while you change direction. If you're out of play front, it's okay to stop until you're part of the pack. That doesn't mean until the person catches up to you who is the pack, because at 10 feet you are now the pack and you are to get moving. If you stay stopped up until the pack, which you think, oh, well, this person is the pack, they come up to me, well, that's 10 feet of you being stopped, which may happen quick, but um, you're stopped when you're out of play front. Um, if you are out of bounds, you're allowed to be stopped until you can come back onto the track. Um, where this comes into play a lot is uh, if I hit somebody kind of forward from behind them, so I hit their hip with my hip or my thigh, and I push them out of bounds to the outside, and I come to a, a halt real slow. Um, but I'm still part of the pack. They don't have to be sitting here barely moving. Um, while I'm barely moving, they can stop because in time, either I'm going to not be part of the pack or I'm going to catch up with it allow them back in. Okay. Um, if somebody stops when they're not supposed to, even if it's like this, uh, I stop here and I'm waiting one second and then, oh, 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 and you see, oh, right? Which brings your attention, oh, that's right, you were stopped, right? Um, if they're stopped, they're stopped, and it sucks, that's a penalty. Um, those are probably the penalties I call the most for especially newer skaters to this rule set because they just forget and they stop, they're as part of the pack, and they didn't turn around. If you as a skater realize quickly, <laughs> quickly turn or something, right? Um, or try not to make it obvious because uh, if, if a ref doesn't see it, they're, they're not calling. But, but if you go, <gasps> and you bring attention to yourself, or you're like, oh, and look at him, I just stopped. Pardon me? Yeah. Because yeah. you're impacting the direction everyone's going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> there's a lot of questions around anti-derby direction or clockwise. Uh, this will happen a lot of times when somebody gets hit to the inside or the outside. Um, a lot of times you'll see these. Uh, if I had. Like a pair of to reset themselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if I'm on my skates, you're seeing me. You know, like, oh, okay. Um, what I typically say is if it's a big swoop, that's not okay. That's, I've just gained the advantage of getting further back on the track to get back in sooner. Okay? If it's one of these quick, that's okay. All right? And I typically do talk about that in, in rules. Yeah, but, but, so, yeah, but resetting after block is stopping, right? So the question, well, their foot just went opposite direction. You know, okay. The, um, so a quick one, I, I, I don't call. Um, also, sometimes people can't help you get hit, and you're like, whoa, right? Um, but a big swoop, it makes it really obvious. Yep, they just made it. Um, the other thing is sometimes people uh, get hit out of bounds, um, and I'm here, and you see this, that's not a penalty until this happens, right? So I have not, even though I've stepped back here, I could still go like this, and it's, I haven't gained, haven't gained that ability to go in sooner because this person's barely moving, ha, ah, oh ho, right? Um, so that's something to watch for, these little sticky situations of just because somebody put their foot back like this is not anti-derby direction until <laughs> right. over exaggerate but I mean that's uh, this you'll see this you'll see this and if they pick it up sorry no nope, nope you just gained two feet which allowed you to come in earlier which is an advantage by doing something you shouldn't be doing This, not this, right? So if Derby Direction is here, this, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call anything on this unless they gain the advantage of 
utilizing that. I have a question about directionals. Um, okay. So when someone cuts in on you, at what point? I'm sorry, so when somebody cuts what? When somebody cuts in right in front of you. Okay. Okay, so the, the question is, is uh, Dee, could I borrow you right here? Um, uh, a directional, uh, at what point does me turning sharp into you become directional? So I'm not going to hit you. Ooh, maybe. Maybe. No. Um, the answer to the question is straight across is not okay. Anything other than straight across. So if I were to go, so derby direction is this way, okay? Um, and I'm skating, and I'm coming in like this. As long as I even slightly straight across but forward is okay. Completely straight across. So if I come in like this and I hit, this is okay because I'm going this direction. If I turn with my chest just to make it more obvious and come straight across into you, this is still legal. That is not okay. So derby direction is your wheels going derby direction, right? So going counterclockwise and forward. Um, if my wheels are not going forward, then I'm stopped or anti-derby direction. Are you thinking about kill shots like hockey stop, yeah. blocks? Okay. Yeah. I think what happens there is she does it slightly in front and then the person impacts her on her side. So she's not necessarily always like going into them completely there or she's at a slight angle, which is what makes it legal. She'll either get a little bit in front and then that person initiates contact with her legal zone, legal blocking zone, or she'll be at enough of an angle where it's not like completely. If I don't see one, one thing you'll see a lot, um, especially around leagues or teams that's new to USARs, is uh, stopping with blocks. So if I'm, if I'm in front, even plow stopping here, um, and I stop, or this person stops for a second, you can stop to recover from a block, but then what? Now I'm just sitting here, and she's just sitting here. We've already recovered from a block. If I don't start slowly going again or she doesn't try to like skate around me, uh, you have to think about at what point is that the call of, hey, you're both stopped. Or I come in front, I hockey stop, and I stop. I haven't recovered from a block. If I don't make that impact or they don't make that impact, I'm not recovering from a block. Their, their wheels during the hockey stop are still going derby direction, meaning even if you're sliding sideways, you're still going derby direction. But if you stop and then try to make a hit or let them come in. So I'm just trying to think through your scenario. But so, it often gets called as a stop block because some of our skaters do the sharp hockey cuts and then they slip. So like if what she does is like if, if this were the skater, she will hockey Can you Can you hop out here? I'm sorry, just because we have lots of cameras and... Uh, what she typically does is like if you're on the line and she wants to stop you, she'll come in, hockey stop here. You'll come in and then she'll pop for it. Yeah, so or she might she might be getting penalties in that scenario because if she's she's stopping without a hit, um, they usually make or she'll make okay. contact and she'll hockey stop she's into the person. The hit she is stopping and the hit comes because she stopped. Okay, well, well, but if the hit's coming because she stopped, that's different. But if she's hitting during the during the process, yeah. She comes here and then pops. Okay, so again, these are tough calls. Um, you're and, and, and I, going that way, even if you're hitting that way. That's yeah, 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 yeah. But what I'm going to go with, with th thank you very much. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry, somebody just went flying. <laughs> Squirrel. Um, okay, so back to business. In, in, in these scenarios, um, they're, I'm going to talk through it. So if they come in and stop, hockey stop right in front without making contact, you've stopped. You're, what, what, are, what do we do for stops? You have to change direction. You have to, you know, momentarily from getting a hit, you're out of play front. Are any of those scenarios? How long was the stop? Was it really just like a... Okay, you know what I mean? And then you go, that's, you're not going to be, oh my gosh, you stopped for 0 0.02 seconds. 
that's a penalty, right? So please keep all this in mind. Um, if you make the contact, that's perfectly fine. The shoulder comment, when does the shoulder happen? Are you stopped and then the shoulder comes in, right? Or as you're sliding, does the shoulder come in? I get called on directional blocks a lot. I skate backwards. I am like, a, I don't know, 80% of the time maybe I skate backwards. Um, and if I hit with my shoulder, as my toe stops or I'm getting pushed, my wheels are still going, okay, track is this way, just so everybody can see, right? Um, as I'm getting pushed, my wheels are still going derby direction. I'm still getting pushed even if I hit back with my shoulder. So I'm hitting anti-derby direction, but I'm going derby direction, right? So this is not an illegal hit if I'm hitting this way while I'm still skating derby direction. It can only be an illegal hit if she's really short and you hit her in the face. Yeah, yeah. Uh, same goes for people who are skating here who come back with shoulders. Their shoulder, the hits are anti-derby direction, but they're still going derby direction, okay? So really think about, oh, you can't, you counterclockwise or clockwise block. No, it's not a clockwise block. It's not me stopping and hitting, or it's not me going the wrong direction and hitting. I am going the legal direction, and I'm just. Yeah. <laughs> I think if we, we struggle with that call right there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it happens. And that's. Flip around and they throw that shoulder. We call us, we call that a lot. Yeah. Directional hit. Uh, one if, thing if you'll. Skates are still going. You're saying it's legal. If wrong. if your skates are still sliding derby direction, if your body, if your momentum is still skates really are, are going derby direction, it is perfectly legal. Um, the thing I will say that I see, and another thing to struggle on is backwards skaters who get on both toe stops and make that hit, are they completely stopped or not? And a lot of times that act of really loading up on this hit will stop and then they hit and that would be a penalty. Right. But two toe stops down is not a penalty. Is two toe stops down is not a penalty. Yeah, I, and, and, and I'll teach. Did that answer your question? Probably. Okay. Uh, I will, I will, one of my fundamentals is, is teaching to, hey, only have one toe stop down at a time. You know, which way are you getting pushed and which foot is back, right? Because when you get that second one down and you, and you set on it, that it's going to stop you compared to letting that slide a bit and, and hitting. I'll just ask my question. Okay. Uh, so uh, with the two toe stops, if you have somebody that turns around, does it correctly and everything, but stops with both their toe stops, but at the same time, they suddenly get pushed by another player and they are again pushed on their toe stops. Okay. Going to derby direction. That's great. Great question. Great question. So who made the impact? In, that, in, your, scenario, in your scenario, who initiated the block? Who, who made that initial impact? Uh, it would be the, the person on the toe stops. So... Um, okay, so if the person comes to a complete stop and I just made a block, uh -huh. like I initiated the block as I'm stopped, that's a penalty. Okay. But the act of me stopping, it, even if I, I'm about to <laughs> turn or whatever, but I come to a stop and then I get hit by somebody else who starts pushing me, that's perfectly okay. They're the ones hitting me. Um, and the fact that they're pushing me, I'm continuing to move. If they stop pushing me and I come to a stop, that's still legal momentarily because I just recovered from a block. Or maybe I want to turn around at that time too. You know, how long are you going to sit here? Um, but again, think about as an official how tight do you want to call these scenarios forever? Um, consistency is super key game to game to game, meaning um, however you start a game, you should finish that game. If you're calling super tight the first half and then the second half you're not calling super tight, try, try to be consistent for that game. The next game you can try something different and you're like, oh man, yeah, that was really bad. I feel, like, I feel bad. Um, find what you feel for you is consistent um, and how you want to call those. 
because if you're calling every tiny little stop, I just got hit, I, you know, she's pushing me, derby direction, and then she stops pushing me and I come to a stop here and you call me right away, I was recovering from a block, right? Um, on the flip side, if your head ref comes to you and is like, oh, it's not a penalty, really that was recovering from a block, don't be consistent, don't consistently suck. I guess is what I'm saying, right? So consistency is a virtue unless you suck. So, um, uh, meaning if, if, if you learn something new along the game, right? <laughs> I know, sorry. I just like to, everybody's awake now, great. <laughs> yeah, yep. Um, so if, if you learn something through it, uh, just then you don't have to call it for the rest of the game. So when I'm saying consistent, you're like, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'm not going to keep calling that this game. Um, forward direction, right? You're going to see um, I, could, I could on my wheels barely move this because I'm like, okay, well, I can move. I'm still going derby direction. Um, I can't really roll right now because I'm on shoes, but this is okay. You're going to see people that barely like doing this little baby walk type thing. That's okay. You're going to see people picking up their feet like this. That's not okay, right? Stepping in place is not forward direction. Um, and then you're going to see smart asses like me. Hey, I'm stopping temporarily to change direction. Hello, it's okay, right? Um, you laugh, but he does this. Yes, he does. <laughs> uh, only to them. <laughs> only to these two. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fun. And typically during scrimmages, not, well, I mean, it can be during some game, but I wouldn't do something that, like that terrible. Normally, I'll try to make them smile. Oh, how many points? How many points do I have? Like, I haven't even done a scoring pass. How many points? Because it's okay to ask certain questions or, you know. This some... is the guy at Nationals when he's on the oh, okay. line. So, goes, they can't do that! <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall that. <laughs> I can either confirm or deny. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, two more quick points on the directional that we see a lot and we work with and uh, as skaters you guys might see and we get a lot of complaints about is the hitting off the line, usually with the pivots. And again, it's just like he said, if it's lateral, then we're gonna call it. But if there's any, even that one degree of forward motion, it's good. Yeah, That's why a lot of times you'll see me at scrimmages come up and say, hey, convince me you're moving forward more. Uh, yeah, just convince me you're moving forward more. That's all. yesterday about Jumping over the line where it's your foot's not touching the yeah. whistle. Okay. Talk about that a little bit. How you can touch the person. Well, 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 quick. I want to. I want to. I want to finish the other thing on directional. Um, the skater you guys are talking about with the, with the hockey stops, uh, she gets called on directional not because of what she's doing. She gets called on it because of where she's doing it. So she's doing that one degree forward motion on the apex, which when she does it right with geometry, gets her about a five degree going backwards the opposite direction. Wow because of where she's doing it on the track. And that's when I usually end up calling that skater on it. Not because she's coming in intentionally backwards or making that hit and stopping. It's because when she makes that hard cut, she's doing it on the apex, and so she's actually going backwards on the track. And that's something that's hard to see from anywhere else unless you're right there with them on the track, on the inside. So if you can, I mean, that's just a really hard thing to see, and it happens right in front of you. Okay, there's, there's nothing wrong, and I'm going to say this, Reptacular and I have refed together a good amount. Um, there's nothing wrong with being a super strict ref, um, or calling it what, what people will say, calling it really tight. Boy, they're calling it really tight today. Um, as long as you're consistent. And especially in a league, if you have officials that are calling it really tight, that's sure going to make it easier when you go play about where they're not, but you're going to be like, oh my gosh, there's so many forearms and they're so handsy and blah, 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 blah. You're used to being called, right? On the flip side, if you have a, a lenient ref that allows, you know, uh, well, come, come, what, what impact is this? What imp really, come on, guys, what impact is this? What? So they're touching, okay, right? And then you go to a place where they're calling it really tight. Your whole league is used to, oh gosh, we've been skating this way and now they're calling these penalties. Well, 
you know, my, my advice is accept the call and you need to adjust for whatever game, whatever tournament you're at. Um, and don't go yelling at officials. This is for the skaters. If you're getting yelled at as an official, take it to your head NSO, the head ref, you know, immediately. Like, you do not need to be taking abuse. Um, and they will shut it down. And if they don't shut it down, then they're not doing their job. You get insults and misconducts where they're yelling at uh, of ref. <clears throat> yeah. So, so the question is, can you give coaches insubs or misconducts for yelling at you and stuff like that? Uh, you could absolutely kick them out if you wanted to. Head ref could kick them out. You could give them a warning the first time. You could start assigning penalties to the captain. So the captain has to... If the, a, if the, the captain the has to be a skater. Right. Yeah. Um, if the alternate's a skater, you can assign penalties. The, if the alternate is a skater and they're the ones doing it to you, you can assign penalties to them. Um, but typically, the captain is always a skater. The rules will say, you know, for certain penalties, the penalty goes to the captain. If the captain fouls out, the team has to assign a new skater as a captain. So you're always going to have a captain on skates who's going to get these penalties. A lot of times our coaches fall the head as well. Yeah, yeah, and that's very common. So, so skaters are always going to be a captain, and then you want the coach to be able to yell or, or say official reviews or be a part. They're going to have the A. Um, unless you're like, hey, I just need you here to run lines, and you have uh, another skater who you want to be a part of, you know, all the action, then they could be the A and stuff, yeah. Great. Um, what did I miss? Would you like to talk about making sure you are in the right position to make those calls on directions, such as the example Nick gave? Because if I'm on an OPR, I shouldn't be making those calls. Yeah. Main one, two, on the okay. Yeah, so real quick, we'll talk about, um, and some of you have already heard this, is really positioning for the different, for the different pos positions and what you should be looking at. Right? So if you're, if you're an outside pack ref, you should not be looking at the inside line down, way down the track and calling penalties on somebody on a cut on the inside line. Like, what are you doing? Right? You have a job. You should, you should be focusing on, you know, the outside half of the track. What are all these arms doing? Are there impacts there? Are there cuts going out on the outside? You know, the flip side of that is inside pack ref. Well, yeah, you might be sitting where you are. And, you know, in the back and calling things way up front, your focus is way out. If you see it, of course, I would say, of course, call it if you're so obvious that, that it's there. But you're not doing your job, right? Your zone, you should be focusing on your zone. Why are you looking way the heck up front when you're rear unless I'm asking you to shift, right? Um, your job is to be looking at the back. You know, what's happening here with pack definition. If people are out of play back, that rear inside pack ref is shifting. What's happening back here? Is there contact back here? If there's out of play fronts, the front's shifting forward. You know, if, if the pack, if I'm way forward, you know, I'll have my rear inside shift up some. You know, so they're covering pack where they're not way in the back. Um, I don't know. I, I just think it's very important to be focusing on your zone, right? It's hard enough to see all the penalties. Um, to see everything happening with all the skaters, especially if you're trying to absorb every single thing on the track at the same time. Okay. There was something somebody the wanted me to... Yeah. Lines that where you start and have to Thank you. I was like, I know. Okay. I, what, 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 how did I get stuck? I had to talk about this yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so pivot lines, blocker lines, jammer lines. Uh, pivots start in the pivot box. On the line is okay, over the line is not okay. Um, what's important about over the line? A toe stop over the line. Um, if, if, if the line is this table and I start like this, is that okay? Yeah, it's touching over the line. Like, I mean, why would I start like this? I don't know, because I'm a jerk. <laughs> Woo! You know, um, it's not gaining any advantage. I'm not touching over the line. On the flip side, you will find. Uh, Again, I hate jammers like me. Um, when you jump, um, 
your position on a track is, while you're in the air, is where you left. So jumping the apex, for instance, or, or things like that. But uh, sometimes you'll find five seconds, and I'm a jammer, and I'm counting down on my head, and I leap before the five seconds. It's not a false start unless I touch before the whistle, right? So I've already jumped halfway to the blockers. Beep! I hit before blockers are like, okay. They look, there I go, right? Like, oh my gosh. And what's the penalty to me? Oh, geez, well, if I mess up, I start 10 feet back. Okay, I don't care, right? Um, it's different than the jammer line. We, we've talked the end of that thing. Five seconds, and then I get a bunch of speed, Woo! right? It's different than just being here and leaping. So I'm not gaining speed and leaping. You, you'll, you'll see some of these things, um, and you're like, they were in front of the line, but they weren't because their position is behind the line until they touch. So that was something we talked about. Yeah. Um, there was also a lot of questions of, uh, we're going to do, uh, well, let's see, derby directions this way. Okay. So the track is this way. You're going to be a blocker in front. Um, this is not my teammate. Okay. This is my opposing pivot and I'm a pivot and uh, I'm touching and I'm like this. Is this a penalty, right? No, okay, now uh, this jammer, so this team's jammer comes up behind me and is hitting me. Is this a penalty? But I'm, but I'm using an, a, an opposing blocker to assist me and slow me down, right? Right, so it was like, oh, this is interesting. So I'm, I'm using my hands on an opposing blocker to assist me in blocking and I'm gaining an advantage off of it, right? So we kind of talked through this scenario yesterday, but really it comes down to this is one action. My hands are not legal as a, a uh, blocking. I can't block with my hands. What is the impact? Is this person falling? Are they losing position? Okay, no. So this is not a penalty. This coming in here, I'm able to block here. If, if they were hitting me in the back, this is a, you know, and I fell, that would be a back block here, right? But all this is, all this is legal and fine. Truck and trailer, and I'm using this person. Now, again, remember I said, you know, what are you doing? Or, or get out of the way um, or speed up if I, push, if I push this person down as a react of, I got hit so hard that I pushed forward and she fell, that would absolutely be a penalty. So that goes back to what's called the bullet and the gun. Who's responsible, right? I'm responsible for all my own actions regardless of what happens to me. So my team or not my team can hit me and I go flying. I'm responsible for everything I'm doing right now, even if I came through and, oh, and, you know. Yeah. Pivot, pivot, helper. Or the, yeah, where your pivot so was you're in your, your blockers behind them and before. And the they're touching each touching. other. So you're in your respective boxes, yeah. but like your pivot helper that. is touching the back of that pivot. Before we take off. Before we take off, before the starting and then whistle. They, yeah. I, like a it's an assist after the whistle, like but they have whistle. their hand prepped. Yeah. There. Oh, okay. I don't remember talking about that. Um, touching is going to be perfectly fine. Um, so touching them even before, before the start of the whistle? Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 this is fine. Yeah, I, I could, in fact, I could touch the opposing team here. In the starting block? Yeah, yeah. yeah even, even right next to it. Yeah. yeah. I'm not over, so again, I'm not in that box. <laughs> <laughs> we got that on camera, right? No. Um, uh, the pivot versus the regular blocker. Top, like reaching over that line and touching that person is fine. Yeah, just, just like it would be okay if I start like this. I'm, I'm not touching over the line. Um, it wasn't the hand being over as much. As I know, I, but it, but again, but touching. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. There's, there's no not affecting. As much right. as yeah. Right. I think the the question comes in is when the assist happens. I think that's really what the issue is. And I would say as long as you're both moving forward, then there's nothing. It's nothing wrong. Yeah. If my 
blocker, if me as a blocker is standing there, the whistle blows and I shove my pivot without moving forward. Yeah. Or if you move backwards based on, on that motion, then yeah. yeah. Uh, so That's where the penalty would come in, I feel. Yeah, well, again, it's how long are you stopped and do you have a reason for being stopped? Yeah. Um, what I would caution about this tactic or this thing, if I'm a coach, what if you push a little too soon? So pivots themselves, they don't get the false start warning. If your pivot is over the line, and I, and I will mess, I'm, I'm normally a pivot in, in USARS. Um, I'm just too lazy to jam anymore. I'm out of shape, and I'm, I'll say I'm getting too old, but there's so many people older than me who are like, oh, I'm still doing derby, and I'm 80. Well, okay, great, thank you, and um, <laughs> fine. Um, pivots. You're sitting here on a line and you know the other pivots, we're looking this way, the other pivots here. Um, if you, I mean, you'll get those head movements or, you know, five seconds and you'll count to four and like go like this, just trying to get them to, oh, because they want to race you off that line. If, they're, if they step over that line to where they're touching, they're excluded from the jam, right? It's not a penalty, but they're return to your bench. But you can take a step forward before the whistle as long as your foot doesn't make contact yes but but i i super caution pivots as a jammer they're gonna catch on right i mean it's like okay now a low rider's jamming again okay watch well, he jumps that line so i don't i don't do it often at all um but as a pivot if you mess up you can count to five seconds that doesn't mean the person's gonna blow the whistle exactly at five seconds and your five seconds might be different you mess up you have no pivot that whole jam. And now it's, you think of power jams and how crazy that is. If the whole opposing team can focus on just one blocker, uh, basically like the jammer, one person, that sucks. So don't play games as a pivot. That would be me as a, if I was a coach telling you as a league, hey, find your spot. You're racing off the line. That's fine if that's your guys' game plan, but don't try to jump it. Don't try to push for extra power that's not going to help me i'm on a pivot line and you're touching me and beep if i'm not ready and you push me and if you push me too i could i could fall i'm, I'm much faster on my own especially if i have somebody against me i'm going to shift give them my back i'm sure as heck not going to give them my chest right so now i'm here and i'm leaning right up into them i mean my butt this is my opposing pivot you know, this is my line. I'll be, I'll be right here all day. I don't care. If the whistle can blow. I just have to kind of stand up in front. I don't even have to rush. So it's, it's different tactics for things. So. Um, just a quick observation from my point from this past women's season. I never saw a single successful assist from the hand on the back to the pivot. What happened usually was that hand would be on that pivot. That whistle would blow. That pivot would go. And you'd see this hand go, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, completely. Every yeah. single time. I never saw a single successful. That's and then this person's funny. hanging out to dry because they're off balance and the yeah. blockers are coming up. <laughs> uh, hold on one second. I'm sorry. We have a question here first. Uh, so I have a question about the back line and the pivot blocks. So okay. the same? Like, I cannot be touching it at all. Behind the pivot. Like, a lot of times. That's the blocker, the blocker line. And, like, trying to block the, the pivot helper, basically. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, a good strategy for pivots is to stay in the front. Um, you don't want to be trapped as a pivot and then have the opposing jammer go active and then you have to fight through all the stuff. Um, but the line, the line itself, the, yeah, the pivot line is the front line. The next line, think of that as the blocker line. Blockers can be touching that line. Pivots should not be on that line. You have your box, your area, your four feet. They've got their six feet, and then you've got the jammer line behind. But as long as they're lined up, and if the pivot is on the back line, they want to be at the back of that box. Because trust me, this happens. Yeah. As long as their toes are, if they got their toes in front of the line, even yeah, if they're thank skating, you. so that's that's line. that's fine. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to say is this line. The first line is the pivot line. On the line is okay. And you've got the box. The next line, that is your blocker's line. So pivots do not be on that line. That's the blocker's line to be on if they want it to be on that line. So, but my butt can sure be over that line, right? If that's what you're wanting.
Okay. I have a quick question. Okay. I don't know if it'll be quick, but um, <laughs> so we well, hold on. Just before you ask this question, just for the sake, we have this goes to 9:45, so we're at a minute of time. Um, I'm perfectly okay. I just want everybody to know we're right running up on time. So, so um, jammers are always in play for each other, right? So if a jammer out in the open field hits an opposing jammer out, and then the jammer is kind of bolted forward. And this jammer is slowed down. Yeah. And they're not able to. Got. I, I got. I got it. Reset. Okay. Is the pack allowed to race forward and re-engage said jammer still on the track okay. because jammers are always in play? Yeah. Or great. Great question. I'm gonna. I'm gonna jump forward with it. Uh, so the question is, jammer on jammers. Uh, they never. Jammers never define pack. Active scorers never define pack. Right? They are always in play to each other. Engagement can happen anywhere around the track. So jammers are halfway around the track from the pack, all the blockers. One jammer uh, hits the other jammer out and really launches them forward and then just comes to a really slow halt. And now you have 30 seconds of somebody waiting while somebody, <laughs> we're winning, right? Uh, Hey, and why wouldn't you? Heck, I've done it. You know, that's stupid, but I've done it, right? I just wear the clock down, and, and that's fine. So the, the, the defensive way behind that is, well, heck, the, the other team, like your team of the person who's out, they need to come forward to catch this. So uh, they can hit jammers as long as they're in the pack, sure. right? And if all of one team is forward, so even if the other team stays real slow, if all of one team is forward, they're pack. So typically what would happen is, yeah, that team is getting on their horse and coming up to catch this jammer who's being a jerk to get their other, to let their jammer back They hit that jammer out, regardless of how far forward the other jammer is on the out of bounds, they get to come back in because the jammer who hit. No, 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 all it's, all it's doing um, so the question is, uh, if the pack then passes the jammer, there's no cut track yield yet, right? Um, they would allow it back in. No, you have to come in behind that jammer. What if they, the, the team that comes up is like pushes that jammer Perfect. the track? That, the jammer is what's important, then they could come in. Okay. And that's okay. the goal is to get that opposing jerk of a jammer or active score to move forward so you can get back in and get some points. Yeah. So great question. Um, I, I don't have any plans. I'm just going to say this. Uh, the, the schedule only says one session today. Do it again. Yeah, so I'm happy to hang out here. You guys are welcome to stay. We could, we're going to take a break. Um, you're welcome to come back. We can just continue with a lot of these scenarios, talk other stuff. Um, I, I don't want to start over and kind of go through all the stuff I've talked about three times, uh, especially since this wasn't on the schedule. So happy to answer a lot of scenario questions, uh, more in-depth rule stuff. So let's take a five minute break, bathroom break, whatever stretch, and then we can continue. Thank you so much. You saw it started and I thought I'm a new official. I can skate really well. I've skated all my life. Um, I'm gonna start refing USARs. So the very first year USAR started national, uh, regionals, nationals, and I, and I refed for years of USARs. Um, worked my way up. I, the world head ref for USARs for the World Roller Games in China and Barcelona, the last two World Roller Games. Head official. Uh, Dee's here. She was with me on both of those. Ref Tacular was with me on the last one in Barcelona. Um, we've refed nationals a lot. Um, I hate refing. I'm just being honest. Um, and that's why I don't ref unless I have to ref. I love playing. I'm a, I'm a skater at heart. Um, Co-ed national champion with Oli Rollers. I skate with the Oli Rollers, if anybody's heard of them. Um, yeah. That's, that's my home league. I'm from Olympia. Um, I skated with them for years. Um, when they got into co-ed, I'm like, gosh, thank you. Finally, I can skate with you guys in USARS. Um, and then COVID. They dropped out, uh, meaning they just, they're done. Um, haven't came back yet. So when I got an option to skate with some of the Fountain City girls and we joined them, we won nationals last year and we did a bank track tournament, won the bank track tournament, woo, you know. Um, so that's my background. Um, on the rules committee, Dee's on the rules committee. She's, like I said, she's done worlds uh, with me every time, done nationals, Reftacular. He's kind of grew up with me in USARS too, under, I don't want to say under my wing. Um, I, I don't want to, you know, look at, look at me, um, you know. Um, 
but you're you're in good hands for for rule type questions. That's all I want you to know. Um, yeah. Um, the first thing, so kind of continuing um, with the stuff from earlier today. Uh, I, I talked about big hits yesterday, and I could see a lot of people were like, "Oh, oh, um, big hits are allowed." Like you could level somebody as much as you want. It happens way less in USARS. USARS is a fast game. So even big hits, typically you're propelling somebody forward. You know, um, it's not like other rule sets. Um, what I do want to talk about, and I'm sorry, is super quick target zones, blocking zones. Um, Reftacular, you're amazing on this. Um, there are certain parts of the body I can target. Okay, so targeting is shoulders to mid thighs, chest, all the way down the arms to hand, excluding what I'll say the bra straps, mid back, all the way down. So these are places on his body that I can target to hit as hard as I want to target and hit. So it doesn't matter if I take him off his feet, it doesn't matter if he's not paying attention and I come in and absolutely level him like I'm a douche or whatever you want to say, you know, a, a scumbag. Um, if I get booed by the people, if I injure him, right? It doesn't mean I have to be liked. I could be this villain. Um, it's legal. And as an official, how can I kick somebody out for a legal hit? Okay. Um, the legal blocking zones is where on my body can I hit him? So what parts of my body can I use to make these big hits or small hits or just put them where I want to put them, right? So shoulders to mid thighs, all the way around my body, even, even my spine, excluding about here in my arm down. So even though I can hit his hands, I can't use my hands. I can't come into him like Superman, right, and, and hit him hard. So I want that to be said because when I'm talking about big, huge hits where people get taken off their feet, I want you to know it's okay. Um, as long as I'm hitting with the right part of my body, okay? Um, the, the second part of these big hits, because people are thinking, man, well, that's not, that's not fair if, if I'm not paying attention and I'm here and he takes me off my feet five feet, you know, it launches me to the inside of the track. Well, it was legal. You should be paying attention. I'm sorry. Yeah, it sucks. Um, but what's people try to do against is if he were to be hitting me and I present my back in the last second, right? So now um, he has now hit me in an illegal part of my body ah! and I fall. Um, that is not a penalty, right? I haven't established my new position to lose my position, right? And really who hit who? It did. Did the, the act of you coming in or, or whatever else? A lot of people will try to play that game. I try to play that game as a jammer, you know, of like, hey, hey, look at, or I, if I already have my established position and I'm skating down the line like this and he hits me in the back and I fall over, I lost my position or I just went over the line, that would be a penalty for him, right? But if I'm here and I'm skating up and as he comes and hits, oh, I spin. Or if I like to fling around, <laughs> right? And somebody hits me and it just happens to hit me in the back. That's not going to be a penalty. Back block, it was a back block, hit me in my back. Well, I mean, how could he not? Or maybe he hit you in your chest. Who knows where he hit you? You were a whirling dervish, you know? So think about having an established position um, is what matters. If you establish that position and they hit you in the back, if your feet are planted, you're here and they hit you really hard in the back and you lose your established position or they gain an advantage based off of it, um, that would be a penalty. It is not a penalty if they hit you in the back and you go like this. Except it's a penalty. If they uh, it would be a back block. So if he hit me in the yeah, if he hit me between bra straps, uh, he gained a position, I fell, I went out of bounds, it's a back block penalty. Um, but if I'm here and he hits me in the back and I get pushed forward four inches, that's not a back block penalty. He didn't get around me in my wall. He didn't get around the other people in my wall. If there's a wall, right, even a two wall, it's not a penalty. So, so he went like that. 
You know, there's there's no penalty there. It may have hurt. So what if pushing you up that four inches brought you past your buddy and, you know, his hips now past theirs and then you got the penalty? Well, that's, that's why I said he, if he, yeah, in my scenario here, he did not get past that. Um, where it changes is exactly where you're going. If he, I get pushed forward six inches, four inches, which allows him to now get past my team or my wall, there's some points, and you don't have to say points because it doesn't even matter for a blocker to blocker. It would be the same situation. He has now gained an advantage. Took me out of my established position and gained an advantage. Just getting me kind of out of my established position by four inches but didn't gain anything, I'm not gonna call a back block penalty on that. Um, if I'm right at that 10 foot line and pushes me forward four inches and pushes me out of play, so let's say this is a jammer and I'm a blocker and that little bump pushes me over out of play. I've lost my established position and that would be a back block. So little tiny differences can say, yes, it's a back block. No, it's a back block. Okay. So I think I know the answer to this. So if you're positionally blocking up front, Nick's behind you. And let's just say he was repeatedly, is it douche blocking? Was, am I saying the same thing? I don't know what it is. But douche, douche, yeah. Let's say, no, but let's, right behind him. Get all okay. the way behind him. Okay. And you just keep douche blocking right and over, and over, and over, but he never moves position. You're getting really annoyed he keeps doing it. Yeah. Is it a penalty at all? It's not a penalty. No, but there's, there's also the flip side too, right? Right? <laughs> okay, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so in our scenario, we're 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 rolling, right? So if if we're rolling forward, um, if we were just stopped and hitting each other, we'd, well, we'd be a penalty for being stopped. But if a scenario where we're both on skates, we're rolling forward, and I'm hitting back, as long as my skates are going derby direction, that is not a counterclockwise bar, a clockwise block. So, um, yeah, because I'm going this direction. I, I, I skate backwards all the time. Um, so I would be the opposite. He, he's coming into the shoulders here. Well, I'm just, I'm just gonna be down here or I'm gonna hit back with my shoulder. And as long as my skates are going derby direction, I can still hit anti-derby direction with my body. So we had a, a switching from maids, our league, one of our league's favorite blocks is the douche ball or whatnot. And so, I, is that the official term? Yeah. No, I, I don't. Shoulder, shoulder hitting, right? That's okay. Our house term. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, but we come in and we would hit with the shoulder right on their shoulder, but your elbows here, and the elbow kind of moves into the raw strap area. Now, yeah. for a while, we were being like, if we made that hit at all, back block. And I don't know. It's that like. Does this fall under the, if we're making the, the majority of the force with our shoulder in a blocking zone, it doesn't conflict, even though our elbow went into that non-blocking sure. zone, the yeah. force is from yeah. the shoulder, not from the... You think it would be what? Okay, so the question, the question for, the, for the camera and everybody for the video, so that's just, I'm gonna change it a bit. Um, let me see which, this direction. Um, the, the question is, if I'm shoulder hitting, but my elbow kind of taps on the, the back in a back block area, you know, uh, is that a back block? Uh, the way I've explained this earlier is uh, more of, let's just say, a shoulder and a chicken wing. So similar that I'm making a legal hit, but then a part of my body that is not a legal blocking zone touches uh, a, a part of the body as well, whether it's a back block or whatnot. Um, it's, it's tough as a ref to judge where is the force happening, right? Um, if I come in with my shoulder and the impact is all here and my arm comes up, you still see daylight, but I'm not really pushing. It's just natural for my arm to come up a bit. Um, that is not a forearm or an elbow penalty because everything was from my shoulder and this just kind of followed a bit. Where it would change is if I come in with my shoulder and then I'm pushing with my arm and it stays on the body and I continue to push, right. Um, that would then be a forearm, but as, a, as an official, and I'm, just because it's the rule, this is not how it's called. So for all you skaters, know that um, you're like, hey, 
I'm here. Uh, there wasn't in my, my arm. That's not, I didn't even push. Well, you know, don't argue with the ref. Um, uh, just bitch at your, your captain, your alternate, and let them go to refs. Accept any penalty you get. It's not going to do you any good. In fact, it could just get you a second penalty, um, and you don't want that. Um, so your scenario is the same situation. If I were to hit with my shoulder, but my elbow is still in the back, right? Where is that force? The fact that I'm touching a part of the body that's an illegal target zone, there's no impact there, right? But does the official see it that way? Maybe. Maybe. Right? So like, but also, if that hit happens and Nick moves his four inches but keeps his position and doesn't advance anything, yeah. there's no call at all. It's all about the impact of the hit after. Right. Him. Right. If I'm, well, even if, well, this, in our scenario, it's a legal hit. This is perfectly legal for me to be here and hit him all day long. And he's like, damn. Or giving him dead leg. You know, I, I get some nice bony hips and I'll come in there right into his, mm. his quad, right? <laughs> Turn him into Star Wars. At, at. <laughs> um, it's a legal hit, right? Um, and I could hit over and over and over, um, and it's up to this person to figure out how do I, how do I defend myself from this, right? Um, it doesn't mean you're a, a cool person for targeting or, or doing it, but we're all athletes, we all want to win, we're all competitive, and if I could Nationals, all I heard is get low rider. <laughs> right, the other team, get low rider. And uh, yeah, the ref's telling him, hey. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you, you know, you want to get in your opponent's head. You want to do whatever. And I tell you what, if I, could, if I could come in and hit your thigh and make you cringe one time, next time I come up, you might flip. Hey, great. That's, that's what I want, right? I want you to flinch or something because now I can utilize that to get around you. Uh, but it's still a legal hit. Um, so, sorry, long-winded. It's legal. That your elbow touching is not the impact point. It should not be called. It will likely be called, so don't do it. Usually it's really easy to see when that hit happens. So they're up here and they make that hit and that person goes down and then you see that yeah. full-on shove down with the forearm. That's yeah. obvious. We, we, I mean, as, as a ref, you can easily see that extra motion, just like with the chicken wing. Well, this didn't do anything. Yeah. yeah. That's easily yeah. seen. The action that we're talking about that gets called improperly is when it's the motion. It's just weird. Yeah. Normal body and it's just the, the initial just hit up. and the follow through. Mm -hmm. Even with this down here, there's going to be a natural, after the hit, there's a natural follow through with the arm and the elbow. Yeah. As long as that we see. That's what we should be calling is that initial. Yeah. I try really hard as a skater to skate like a T-Rex. Um, I talked about that in the first session. I've been called it, you know, I skate like this. <laughs> right? So I still drop my shoulders and do whatever, but when I'm hit, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I don't, I don't want this because it's, it's very likely. Um, I, love, I love refs. I love officials. Um, there are some officials that like to make calls to make it seem like they're doing their job. Um, and, and I say this and I'll say this to, I said this to refs, it's okay to go an entire game and not make a single call, right? Especially USARS. USARS is a penalty light rule set. Um, if people skate it correctly, <laughs> and I say correctly, like they're not stopping, they're not doing anti-derby, I'm not hitting, running back, okay. It's, it's that getting used to derby direction and things. It's a very penalty light. Big hits don't happen often. When they do, people get excited if somebody falls off their feet because you can't open them backwards and stand up or, or whatever, but. So uh, the most common calls over here, blocking out of bounds, blocking out of play. Um, mine are stupid stopping on, you know, stopping, right? So if you're in the pack and you stop, there's only a few reasons why you can stop. But, but people get used to, oh, stop, or even a quick step back. Um, as, as a, and you realize, like you hit out and then, whoop, oh, even if you quickly correct it, I'm sorry, 
I'm sorry, you just did it. You're used to playing a different rule set where you knocked him out and you were going to run back, and that's not legal here. Um, since there's a lot of skaters, it is legal to stop on the track uh, if you're out of play front, if you are recovering from a block, if you are changing directions. So temporarily stopping to do those things are okay. If you get knocked out of bounds, it's okay to stop and wait. You don't have to continue rolling, right? So you stop and wait for them to slowly roll if they're playing that game, which I play. Um, <laughs> Because I don't want you to get points, right? I mean, hey, that's, that's my job is to slow you down. If you're out of play, though, you can't stop? If you're out of play front, you can stop. You Completely off stop. Off no. No, in fact, you don't want to get off the track. Um, so if you're out of play front, so let's, let's talk about pivot breaks. Uh, pivot breaks, this happens a lot with pivots. Um, and let me, well, let me first off say, um, thank you, skaters. I love that you guys are here. If you also ref, I love that you also ref and you're here. If there's official questions, you've been here a lot. If there's things that you want, please raise your hand. I'm going to prioritize. You guys have heard this, so I'll prioritize anything for you guys have been here a lot, okay? Um, but uh, pivot breaks. A lot of times, pivots play front. Um, pivots both go out of play, and they're both out of play in front. Okay, me is head, front, inside pack ref. Out of play for two, I always say two, let these guys know, two people are out of play front, you're out of play. Jostling, and I will talk to coaches and everything beforehand, jostling's okay. So you guys are up front and you're still, I don't care if you're half a track, you're out of play, you're not knocking each other down, so I'll just say the two of you are opposing pivots, you're not knocking each other down, um, but you are touching, you are bumping, you are trying to fight to get up front. That's okay, it's unless you knock one person down, right? So if that jostling creates a fall, well, that's obvious, down or out, right? Um, what if it changes advancement because you're they're, 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 they're out of bounds. They're out of play, there's no position. You guys, you guys don't have a position on the track, right? You're both out of play, you're not part of the pack, so you're not losing a position because you don't have one. But their jostling needs to stop when a uh, jammer slash active score starts coming by. Right, because uh, they can't block that. Yeah, they can help their jammer and they can't block the jammer. First off, uh, the jostling doesn't have to stop uh, for the jammer because they can't block the jammer anyways. Um, but what you can't do is even positionally block that active score coming by. So if the act of jostling is... Can, you have your established line. You guys aren't really established anything. The jammers got their established line or their active score is coming through and you guys are jostling. Well, if you just went in front of them and caused them to divert, yeah, you could get a position, you can get out of play for that, absolutely. But the, the out of play pivots are not gonna block the jammer because they can't. So jostling is not gonna give an advantage there. Does that make sense? <laughs> That's, well, that's okay. I, I think it's more like an incidental thing or, or whatnot. If they're still jostling, if we're saying it's okay for them to kind of fight for a position that neither of them really have, well, let's say white jammers act as score, a white pivot could take and, and jostle and do something with black pivot and mess with them, allowing an assist. Or the jostling... Uh, 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 the, assist white, is, the assist is what I'm not understanding. Need an it's, it's not a physical they, assist. It's, they're trapping the other pivot to get them out of the way so the jammer has an easier route around the two of them. The, the jammer doesn't need an easier route. <laughs> so hold on, hold on. Let me, let me, I've got somebody who's important back here, which I may have been mis, misspoken or missed something. So. so you just started to touch on. You just started to touch on when you are out of play and your skating uh, position. Yeah, I, I can go on so that. So if yeah. you could go into a little yeah. more detail with that yeah. once you finish that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so let, me, let me say exactly what happens in Fountain City. So, so pivots take off. They're out front. <clears throat> we'll say white pivots front, black pivots behind, OK? Are they out of play? Yeah, Nick's yelling they're out of play, OK? They remain out of play. Front person, though, 
starts to slow down, therefore person behind them starts to slow down, or they skate around them and take the front position. While that's happening, they're re like essentially recycling who's in front of each other. Okay. And the jammers come around the outside. Our old rule set said you can't impede the jammer at all, and if the jammer wants the inside line, you have to get away from the inside line. USAR says you just can't positionally block them, but you don't have to change the lane that you're in to give them the best lane. Does that make sense? Sure. So what he's saying is, is if those pivots are out of play and they're skating around each other trying to be up front, they're kind of in the way, but then maybe one of those pivots drags the other pivot to the outside to give their jammer the inside lane so they can just take off kind of thing. That's what he what he that's so, what he's clarifying. So there's a difference between jostling and actively really blocking. I mean if we're just touching if I'm if I'm hitting pivots out of play are not going to be physically really like hitting each other. Um, and the the technical portion of things would be um, if you're out of play front, right, you are not allowed to positionally block the jammer. So if the jammer's got their course and you diverge from your course to positionally block them, you will get a penalty for that. Okay, the caveat of that is out of play back. Out of play back is different than out of play front. So if you're a blocker in the back and you are trying to catch up to the pack, um, you were allowed to stay on your trajectory. You're doing your best to catch up to become part of the pack. Okay, so I'm following my line around the track. I do not have to get off of my line. I am on my horse. I'm trying my best to get back to the pack, and the jammer's faster than me. I, I don't have to yield to them to get back to the pack. Um, however, if my course changes slightly as the jammer comes up to push them out a little bit more, maybe, that would be the penalty. Um, so up front, I would say jostling is fine. It's, it's going to be really rare that that's going to happen. You, you can't positionally block the jammer anyways. When I said the jammer's not going to have a hard time getting by you anyways, because... You can't touch him. Yeah. yeah. You can't get in front of MC Hammer. Don't touch me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe had a question before me. So I want to ask it after her. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if you're that jammer and you're caught behind a blocker and you're out of playing back, as the jammer, can you move them out of your way? If oh, they're just great question. Stay on okay. their line and you've got three of them in front of you and you luckily yeah. you're out of play. What Okay, like, so the question is you're the jammer behind this blocker on their horse trying to get back up to the pack, staying on their line. So uh, can, you, can you cut a little sharper on that line and get in front of them, push them out of the way on the way to getting back up front um, would be a good example of you can't hit an out-of-play blocker. So no. Okay. Right? But you can outrace them. You could, if they're taking the corner a little bit wider, you can come inside. Just don't, don't hit them. Okay. Yeah. I got two questions then. Your mamba? Yes. I, you know, put a derby helmet on and put pads. We have skated. Um, in fact, well, we could talk later. You! Mo money! You! No. I'm sorry, so next question. No. I love you, you're awesome. <laughs> Um, my first question is a piggyback off of what Nathan said. So in my mind, if I have a jammer back here and we got a four wall, can the jammer draw a penalty to the blockers who are in a three wall in front? Is that them blocking out of play blockers um, or is that drawing a penalty? Normally our jammers will sit back there and be like, out of play, but they're not. Engaging. So I, I want I want to take this a little further. So this scenario is uh, we have a three wall um, of of one team, the opposing jammer. This three wall is out of play front, out of play back, out of play back. and this three wall in their three wall. Exactly, they are all trying their best to go forward at the exact same speed around corners. So, so this person's a little slower than this person who's a little bit slower than, you know, vice versa. This guy's this is a fast one on the outside, so perfectly, okay, we're going. Uh, no, I would be calling, yeah, come on, get in, a, get in a, a speed line. If you guys are trying to get up there, 
Um, but it happens. That's why I'm glad you asked it. Yeah. They well, had a three wall race in their wall while a jammer would have the ability to pass them, but because they're all in a wall, they either have to move them. You swim. you have to be trying. Like you have to be going right in order in order for you to maintain this this. Uh, this course that allows you to stay on this course, you really have to be going. If I believe as a ref, if I believe you are positionally blocking this jammer, I'm going to give you a penalty. Yes. Right? And for me to believe it, maybe it happens. Maybe you guys practice and you know exactly the speed. If it happens to where all three, of, and why would, why would I say uh, as a, let's just say I'm a, a fast blocker, why am I skating on the outside trying to catch up the pack? Yeah. Yeah. No, I would get in the speed line, as you've seen USARs, when they're running, right? And I would be trying to get my team back up there quickly so I can block this jammer. So in that scenario, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't try to play the game um, because you're likely to get called. Um, and I would welcome your captain or alternate to challenge and lose a timeout. Um, to to prove I'm wrong, which maybe I am wrong in that scenario, but not likely, right? I got I got one more. I was gonna say, I think to to help clarify what you're asking. Yeah. In that situation, what's the best action for the jammer to do? For the yeah. Yeah. To do? yeah. Well. <laughs> Them this not not to hit, right? You're not you're not coming through. If I was the jammer, I'd look at my score ref and be like, well, you know, I can't be like, but yeah. But it's hard for three people to have the whole track, right? Find that hole on on coming out of the apex. Take that inside line because typically people will go wide. Or if they're cutting that apex, start wide. Come in, you know. It's like find that. Speed line of how do you get around? And like juke to get them to move and open up. If I'm jockeying and juking, then I they're blocking me. Yes, exactly. So if 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 so, I'm disagreeing with you because they're walking out of place. No, but hold on, hold on. You don't want to be as that jammer. Yes. If, yeah. if, then yes. Get, then That's how you pull the penalty. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 Then they get the penalty and you get to so, open. So let me just put it on 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 voice, yeah. right? You like wedging and jockeying. So if then you're, you're yeah. if you're the jammer and you're coming up on this three wall, and if you do end up moving, which causes, like I'd mentioned, you have this established line, causes a blocker to kind of veer off their line a bit. Well, that's showing positional blocking. So that would be an example. Finding a thing looking at like yeah. out of play, right? At, or you don't have to look. Look at the ground and say out of play back or whatever, right? So if, if there's a two wall, because this does happen quite yeah. often. A lot. Yeah. Our two wall falls in the back. So they're out of play and a jammer is there. The jammer is able to go faster than the two wall, but they're skating next to each other instead yeah. of in a single line. Two, yeah. So if that jammer comes up and decides to go through. No, don't go through. If you're, if you're creating a block to an out of, out of play skater, you're going to get a penalty. Just go around them. But then I'm changing my lane to get around them. OK, you're faster. They're trying their best to get up there. I want them to get on the OK, well, my, my advice, my advice, I'll get to you in just a second. My advice to jammers in this situation is get better. Okay. All right. So if you're complaining about, well, I'm okay. Well, good. Get some cardio. Come on. I mean, two two blockers. Again, they should. If they're really trying to hustle, they should be helping each other. They should be taking. You know, is is close to the line. It's like you're getting this thing. And even a two wall for me, great. Well, wait for the corner. Just hop around them real quick. Just hop around and go. Right? And, and if the act of you hopping around shifts their position, then, they, then they're well, getting this positional. Yeah, no, well, who, who moved? Oh, Not both. They both, who? they both do, but if only one moves. Well, who's the one impeding? So even if they both moved, if you're here trying to go to the outside and the inside person moves a bit too, that's not doing anything to you. Okay. I would be assigning it to the person who's actually impacting okay. you. Yeah, okay, so. So the rules specifically say that it, an active scorer cannot block a blocker out of play. Correct. But the act of trying to get around them is not a block. It's not an act like Correct. an act of blocking. Correct. So making contact as you try and get between them, you going like this, trying to sneak by. Yeah. 
why is that a penalty? Because it's okay. not a block. Uh, okay. It's contact. It, it's not, it's it, not a block. Well, is it contact? Okay, so is that then now positionally blocking them? Is the act of me squeezing, does it actually shift them a little bit even off of their established path? The reason I say no is why would you, why would you even attempt it? Like, I might be able to squeeze through without touching. Well, if you can, great, do it. But if that act ends up hitting them, you could get a penalty and why would you chance a penalty, especially as an active score? Right. So this is more coaching than rules, like me saying don't do it, um, <laughs> because you want to get points. You you. But, but it is a penalty, right? Even though it says blocking, that's not a that's not a move to block. If if the action of squishing in front and touching a bit shifts that blocker's trajectory around the track. Just like if they were to shift, then you could get a blocking out of play. Right, yep. Yeah. So it's best. That's why I say just just hop around. And it's not. Maybe it's common in your guys's league, and it's a it's a lot of energy wasted. They should, if they're really trying. It's very rare that they're trying at the same exact speed. While we're talking out of play, something that's come up with some of our newer skaters in the scrimmage is when you're marking out a play, is it better to stay, like say you have a couple of skaters fall down there 40 feet behind on the track, do you stay with them and mark out a play or do you stay at the 10 foot behind the pack and mark? Okay, so this is a great question. So the, the, the question for this is, uh, as, a, an, as an official, as a ref, when you're marking out a play and somebody's falling back 10 feet, somebody's falling back 20 feet, somebody's falling back 30, 40 feet, where do you stay as an official um, to mark the out of play? Uh, and, it, and my answer is it varies. So I'm gonna talk front and then I'll talk back. So as the front inside pack ref, I will stay with the people who are out of play front up to about 20 feet. So I will mark out of play, I'll be out of play for two. I still, because I skate backwards, I have perfect view of kind of what's happening. The caveat is who's up here out of play? Is it one person um, or is it two that consists of both teams? Like how much do I need to be able to see what's happening here, right? And where is my position? So if it's one person out of play front, okay, I'm here with them. If they're half a lap out of play, I'm not half a lap out of front. My rear inside pack person would come up to cover pack definition and to cover more stuff because I'm up front. Um, and I would be mindful and I, the, the jammer, um, so one is I would need to be able to relay, are they coming all the way around and returning to the pack from the wrong direction they left? So that would be a penalty. So I'm still having to maintain that. So on a pivot break, which we're gonna talk about pivot breaks, I never got to that yet. So on a pivot break, the pivot runs, they're out of play, right? Out of play, out of play, out of play. I may go 40 feet, 50 feet on a pivot and then let them go. I've, I've given so many warnings and it's not up to me to let a player know they're out of play. Players should know they're out of play, right? So the fact of they're like, well, you never said out of play. Well, you were out of play. I didn't get a chance. You quickly are out of play by five feet. You made the block, out of play block, right? Um, so if the pivot continues all the way around, they would get the penalty. Um, otherwise, they stop in their way and everything's slow. I still need to focus on what's happening. So I'm sorry because it's a tough scenario, right? Um, if there's multiple people and there's jostling, then I need to have a little more what's going on here so I may be further and again my rear inside pack is is covering the pack definition here um, opposite is the back so the back when you have somebody who took a heavy fall and you could tell or they're out of breath and they're trying their best to catch up it's okay to be 10 20 feet out of play my arm is kind of out of play here as we're going around the corner but I'm still seeing what's happening with the pack it's one person um, I don't care about that impact between jammer and the blocker because I've got a score ref on that situation. So I, I don't need to worry about that. Um, so I do not stay with people way, way out of play. Very long-winded answer. So your arm is not where the pack is? Your arm is 
So, um, so the question is, my arm when there's an out of play, do I do I say uh, out of play, and I'm pointing to pack? Do I say out of play? Uh, am I saying out of play to where the person is? Um, I I don't say uh, pack is here, and I'm like skating like this the whole time as I'm roughing, right? My out of play since I skate backwards. So if I'm skating, uh, let's say. Track direction is this way, I skate backwards. My out of play is the side where the track is. So for officials, if I'm skating forward, my out of play is here, right? But I'm staying with wherever that person's at, so they know they're out of play. The problem when why I skate backwards, if I'm here, right. how am I, right? So I skate backwards all the time. I'm here, out of play. I may not be watching you. I, I, I can kind of tell where you are. I've got other people to do that job if they come around and they're blocking. I'm still watching here, but out of play. And I'm not hollering, out of play, right? Because that's taking my attention off of what's happening. I've already told you you're out of play. I got a question out there. Hey, I got a question on that same aspect. So I'm in front and I have a uh, uh, multiple player, like three, you know, both pivots and a pivot helper out front out of play. Yeah. And I mark out of play. Okay? And Jimmer takes off and they're active and the opposing pivot is smart enough to know that they have to fall back within that 10 feet. But I still have the other two players out of play up front. Do you give any kind of marking to that pivot to let them know they're in that 10 feet? Because normally I would drop my hand once they're in play. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I still want to keep my hand up for the other players out of play. So this happens a lot. I'm going to answer this. Maybe if there's another quick question. Then I want to get into a lot of pivot stuff because there's so much pivot stuff, especially pivot breaks. Um, when I say out of play, and this is why I'll say out of play, um, out of play for one, out of play for two, out of play for three, right? So in your scenario, out of play for three, right? It may go down to two, out of play for two. I, I'm relaying this for my rear inside pack, not for the players. Again, you guys should know. But from the back, he may not be able to tell, is that 10 feet, is that not? My active scorer refs don't want to be having to look off their, their jammer. Are they in play? Who's in play? Who's not, right? So out of play for two. Um, if the act of the pivot slowing down creates pack, which is within 10 feet of the other two, which creates the whole pack in play, or pack is all. I don't say pack is all a lot because you just don't know, but in. That'll be out of play, in, right? And that in may cause that pivot to be part of the pack who moves forward one foot, which now creates an 11 foot. Now they're all out of play again, so in, out of play, red pivot active, right? So now you have two out of play, 15 feet from the pack, they can't block the active pivot. So that, okay. I handle it. Uh, yeah, in fact, in that situation, I wouldn't even say out of play for two because it's so quick and you want, you want the pivot to know that they've broken, right? right? So it would be in, out of play, red pivot active. But in most situations, out of plays, I will let my team know how to play for two, how to play for three, how to play for one, how to play. If it's one, I'm just typically out of play. Two, it's how to play for two, how to play for three, how to play for four. I don't know how you'd have four out of plays. Uh, maybe extended more than 10 feet. So in a situation when that pivot comes back and they don't create the bridge, but they come back within that 10 feet, instead of saying, so I'd say like, out of play for three, and then that pivot goes back and becomes in play, but these are still okay. out, not bridge, I just say out of play two. Yeah, and, and let's say, I, I want to reword things, so they're not going back, because no. Derby is always, I know, I know, I just want a word for, because we have, they're slowing down to, to let the pack come to them, now they are part of the pack, the front two are more than 10 feet, still, then it would still be out of play for two. Yeah. Okay. That, 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 is my, that, that is how I handle things to help my team. Right? That is not an official rule. Yeah. And my team being Team Zebra. Right. Okay.
Uh, <laughs> right? Oh, so who, who of us zebras are watching the people out of play for when the jammer is coming up? Yeah. So the question is, who's, who's watching these out of play people that, are, that I'm not watching? I'm front inside pack. They're half a lap, and I'm looking like this at, at my pack. Who's watching this? Uh, every active scorer has a, a referee designated to them. Every jammer or active scorer. So I am relying on my active scorer. The active scorer job is anything that their active scorer does or jammer does and what happens to them. So the fact that my active scorer ref passes me and they see that my arm is up, how to play for one, you know, and then if that blocker that I'm not looking at does something to the jammer, there's eyes. That's the job of the, the scorer ref. Yeah, you also have, you, you may, you also have outside pack refs, but I, I would really, in that situation, I'm 100% relying on my score ref. Score ref, it's a fun job. Again, you're focused on one person. They don't have to be focused on you. They could be, they could be picking their nails as they're skating around. No. <laughs> but I don't care, right? My job is to be seeing what they're doing and what's being done to them. That's it. Okay. My job is to be seeing what they're doing and what's being done to them. That's it. And the, the score jammer. The score, score ref. The yep. score ref. They're the only one who calls out the jam when the jammer's calling it off. Yes. If you were, if you were, uh, <laughs> Score refs are designated to the score ref for that active scorer, lead active scorer, is the one who should be calling it off. Me as a head ref, or if I have a seasoned inside pack, or, uh, I, I would say me as a head ref, if I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're calling it off and my score refs, <laughs> That's okay. I, I, I would call it off. The problem with that is even if I think maybe they're yielding a penalty that I didn't, yielding a cut track, which I didn't see. Like I see them over there and I'm like, come on, they got, I know they got the point. This is their third pass, yeah. right? And if an outside pack ref calls it, boy, I would be heated. Okay. You know, be like, that's not, not, thank you. You can relay, they're calling it from the outside or something, but you don't, we don't know. Okay. Like maybe, Maybe the hips actually didn't pass. Maybe they didn't get that point. Maybe their wheels over the line and you're seeing it. Maybe, you know. The jam refs called Jam. Jam refs. The particular jam ref for the lead active scorer yes. is the one to call it. If you're a fellow jam ref, if we're both ASRs and my jammer's calling it, he shouldn't start the whistles. Oh, okay. Not even the other ASR. Right. So whoever's got that, that designated to him. No. He could be like, hey, 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 hey. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> okay. But I need my team to get some more points. <laughs> um, and, uh, being lead ASR and having somebody call and have the jam be called, uh -huh. I immediately turn around and be like, who, what, what, who, where, that's mine. Oh, time, okay, cool. Right, it does, yeah, it does get called on time and I get so upset sometimes, I'm like, who just called? Yeah. Oh yeah. Because, you know, again, 90 seconds goes by fast, but there could be things of like, you, you, your mind, it's a lot of work to ref, I mean, you're taking a lot of stuff. Um, Chance, whistle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing I would suggest for active scorer refs, or jam refs, whatever we call it, is more than one whistle. You don't want this in your mouth all the time. Um, however, uh, it, I, I start this in my mouth until I whistle lead or until I hear lead whistled. And then I drop it as soon as I hear lead. And that way I know in my mind, lead's already been called because I don't have a whistle in my mouth. Or uh, if, I, if I whistled it, I spit it out but I would, I would encourage getting a uh, finger whistle too. Um, because what you don't want to do is because the whistle's not in your mouth, because you're here, you, you call the penalty, you did whatever, um, it gets called off and you're... Sorry, sorry. <laughs>
right? Like if it, if you have a second whistle, I you know get get a finger whistle. It's really quick and easy to get up to start calling it. Okay, so calling it off. Um, I know we want to get good to break stuff, so we just kind of brought up something. Is it to the fourth uh, whistle on the first set, or is it to what would be assumed that amount of time? So, okay. for instance, I like it. Uh, I've already got it. Or zoned out, and it's like, yep. Oh yeah. Nope, I've got it. Um, so the question is, uh, well, I'm just going to reword it in a way that for everybody, because this is good for skaters too, especially if you're pivoting or if you're jamming. Um, what whistles are for what? What can happen until what point? Um, uh, officially, to call it off, you need a second tap, upright, inbounds, after, let's just say easy way to say it, or think of it as you need a point, right? So you've, you've legally passed um, an opposing blocker, inbounds, you've got a point, um, you're upright, you're inbounds, you tap twice, okay? It's not tap twice on your way to get your point, you tap twice after you have that point, uh, and then it should be called. Now, um, if you know it's a race and you're trying to get that, um, other rule sets, people are used to this. I don't care if you're doing this the whole way around the track after you get lead. I'm not doing anything. I'm just staring at you like, and you could be looking at me. I'm calling it. I'm calling it. No, you're not. I'm not saying anything. I'm thinking, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Keep trying. Um, none of this matters until you have that point. Um, once you've once you've passed an opposing blocker legally inbound, you've got you know, then you could call it. Um, if there's a race, you can preload to help your ASR know that you're calling it. So when you get that point, <laughs> yeah. So, so when you get that point, you get that second tap, he's calling it, or they're calling it, right? It's two taps after you've got that point. So if you've, you're tapping in there, you get the point, and you fall. Sorry, you only got the one tap after you got the point. If you get knocked out of bounds, right as you're passing, you've got that point one, you're out of bounds. Sorry, you got that one tap, right? Um, and that's when the lead change can happen. So if it is called, shame on the ref for calling it. Um, if it's challenged or if they notice, they're like, oh, um, that's a penalty on you. Okay. Um, so the question is lead change. Let's go through the whistles. So lead changes can happen up until the first whistle of the first set. So you get your two taps, fumble, 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 lead change. I'm, so, I'm sorry I'm slow. I'm sorry I suck as your score ref. Preload so I know I can get this ready next time. Preload and make a penalty on you. I know, right? Right? No, if, if you're preloading and I do call it, then you get a That's your penalty. Yeah. <laughs> it's my mistake because it's not a legal call off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you could you could be like, hey, get ready. Yeah. You could be like, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call it. Whatever. Right. Um, so so le yeah, lead change is the first whistle of the first set. Um, Lead changes can happen up until the first whistle of the first set, okay? Points are the fourth whistle of the first set. I see, so uh, a calling off, calling off, I'm gonna whistle real quick. So the first, Lead change, that's points. So you don't care about the, the, the echoing, da, 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 da. The important one is the very first four whistles that are blown. Lead change, points. Okay. What about penalties? Mm. How long are refs looking for penalties when well, whistles start to blow? Yeah, that first whistle. 
is when the, the call off happens. The first whistle is when the call off, I mean, the jam. Yeah, I mean. Fourth of the first. But there's still Every score point. I, you know, I'd have to look at the rules, but the jam is called off. It's that first whistle. The, the, the problem being. So if, if it's the first yeah, whistle of the first. I, and I, I would have to look it up. Blow right by me and get a point. Then I've given up. Yeah, my position. I, I would have to look it up. Um, but here's. They can. Yeah, yeah, well, you, you don't have to change anything, right? But the problem with blocking after, after the, the jam is done is it's, it's a tough call for officials unless it's super obviously late. Action's happening. And the fact that I'm coming for my hit and the jam gets called off over here, I can't, if, really? You're going to hit? You're going to call me on a late hit when I was already in motion? Like, come on. Um, so it's, it's really tough. Um, I'm going to let Dee look up in the rule book to see if she can find out the official answer to that question. To help as far as safety as refs, when those whistles blow, don't immediately ignore what's happening. As an as a, as a ASR, and if I'm skating around and I'm not leading and I'm watching, I know this, I hear those four whistles, the first set of four whistles, not that fourth whistle, I just stop and stop paying attention. I've just done my my jammer and in service. Yeah. Because something could happen. Yeah. And I just took my eyes off. And I trust me if I'm, if I'm being feeling horrible because I took my eyes off my jammer one time and they got hit instantly. Mm -hmm. I didn't see the action. I went up to apologize to him. I'm sorry, I took my eyes off you. I mean, I probably wouldn't have prevented it, but I at least could have gotten the penalty or had the call. It's not in here, and I need. Yeah. So I mean, just just think of it as. E e Rules committed. <clears throat> yeah, it's. <laughs> It's not expected. I would not expect you as a blocker to, as soon as you hear that first whistle go, to stop everything you're doing. What I would expect is if I'm traveling this distance, beep, 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 and I make that hit, that's, it's obviously a late hit. Um, again, again with, with USARs, things are fast. There aren't a lot of big hits. Uh, typically, even if there is some kind of hit afterwards, it, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. It's not, it's not a hit. It, I might run into you because we're going fast, and you stopped super fast. Oh my gosh! You know it's. Um, yeah. <laughs> but don't just you hear, as soon as you hear the whistle, don't go. Oh, okay. Whoop, 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 okay, because you're right. Fourth whistle is the points, so just hold your ground. Yeah. All right, pivot break. <laughs> we don't have time for pivot break, so we'll, we'll get that next year. Um, pack definition is more important than pivot breaks, and it goes right into pivot breaks. Um, so pack definition is the greatest number of skaters from both teams together, um, unless all of one team that's on the track is together, and there are two or more. I know this is really weird. One person cannot define the pack. So if I have four blockers, three of my blockers are in the box, and I try to run, I cannot define the pack. I need to stay at least with one other person, to, one other blocker, to define the pack. Uh, if two of my blockers are in the box, and I have two left, I can run. If, if, I, wanted to, if I wanted to use speed as defense, I can go. And we're pack. Pack is right there. Uh, I call bridging, I say bridging, even though there's no bridging in this. Um, there's times when pivots break, pivots, uh, there's a lot of teams that like their pivots up front and our pivot doesn't want to be behind somebody because if I'm needed, I don't want to fight to get out, I just want to go. So pivots being out of play um, and the opposing, if you're a pivot, you're out of play and the opposing jammer becomes active. Um, your job is to how do I become active without being blocked by this other pivot right in front of me. Right? Um, either you slow down um, or you get in front of them and then try to slow down um, to get the pack. 
uh, or as soon as you become PAC, you have to go quickly to try to get that out of play again to get, so we talked one, one scenario as a pivot, um, is to force them out of play immediately because you going out of play is making you active. Does that make sense? I, I mean, I see some confusion. The last, the last part. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So. Pieces active. There's already a jammer. In in order for a pivot to become an active score, they have to emerge from the pack. After the you know the other team has an active score, the lead active score. So they have to emerge from the pack. So if you slow down to become part of the pack and immediately leave the pack more than ten feet, that other pivot could be out of play. You've just became active, and they can't block you. So that scenario, there's two pivots in front. Oh, I see it. Yeah. Okay. There, there's other weird scenarios. Uh, let, let's say that there's two pivots and two blockers up front. So two from each team. So you're playing two and two. They're playing two and two. We're all up front. We're the pack. Okay. Uh, the other people are out of play back. Um, the... Opposing jammer becomes active, and you're like, I need to go. I need to become active. But you're, you're stuck in this, this, this wall. You can't get out. All of a sudden, one of your blockers, the blocker with you, uh, slows down. You may not even know it. And becomes part of this rear 10 feet, the out of play people. And pack definition shifts to the back. Or your blocker just took a penalty. Your uh, helper, a penalty, now you're two from the opposing team, and you are the pivot up front, and now there's two and two. So the pack has just shifted from front to back. The action of that happening has just made you as the pivot active. You may not even know that what is when you're skating. It's greater than 10 feet between the four in front and the four in back. Yes, so in this situation, we have pack is front, we have out of play back. Uh -huh. We've got four and four, but the largest group, or even, the pack is front, right? A penalty happens, not even on your blocker. Maybe it's the other blocker, maybe it's the opposing pivot. So the numbers, four, sorry, I have five and five. Four, four and four has just changed to three and four. Greatest number for both teams, pack is now back here. There's 20 feet between us two four, let's say. Well, wh wherever, yeah, 20, 20 feet. More than 10. Uh, 12 feet. Because what I'm saying is... Yeah, that's fine. So this pivot who's up here doesn't even know it. They were part of the pack, and they just emerged from the pack. They are no longer in the pack, out front. They are active. Right. Because they're jammers right there. And the opposing jammer. No, I got it, I got it. Don't go, don't go, don't go. That jammer is now a blocker, and you have the front inside pack. Out of play. Out of play. You're out of play. And they're not listening, and I'm not following the whole track. And they go all the way around, and they're trying to score points as soon as they become the pack in the back. Now they've got a penalty. Right? Um, so there are weird situations where pivots, where jammers can become active without even knowing it or not even wanting to. Right. Um, as a jammer, Mom, are you good? I know it's confusing. <laughs> I know, I know. I'll just get a Sharpie. The reason I ask specifically, there's four and four or 20 feet in between. Pinky goes to the box, okay? Yeah. That makes, sorry, the shiny little. That's okay, yeah. The, what could potentially happen is if there's 20 feet between, now this is no longer packed, this is the pack, but now the pivot's 20 feet out and can't go. They, they already went. That, and that's what I'm saying. They don't know that they went, but they just went. So what if that person just slows down and comes back here? Then does that make the pivot active immediately? The pivot is already active immediately. As soon as, as, soon as the pack shifts to the back. So like I'm pivot helper. Yeah. I want my pivot to go, so I slow down, right? So when they no, okay, but well, hold on. In this scenario, four, four and four, yeah. we go down to three and four. There's nothing that anybody can do to stop the pivot from being active immediately. 
No, 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 no. Like, okay, do your little finger. Okay, ready? There's. <laughs> Uh, okay, so slowing down, she hits 10 feet. Now this pivot's active up here. Yeah, so that was the first scenario I talked about. If, if you're four and four and your blocker or one of the other blockers slows down and shifts the pack to the back, immediately you're active. If, they, if there's a penalty for anybody up here, it immediately shifts the pack to the back, you are active. Yeah. And none of us... None of us up there say, say I'm up in the front with the, with the two pivots, um, including the one that just became active, didn't realize that they were active. I can't do anything to them right. because I'm not a play technical. Right. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, Mom, you're trying to keep your pivot out and it would slow down. Yeah. The second you hit the backpack, your pivot's out. And they don't have to keep it. Right. So it's a, you know, like the defense part, but for offense, it's really good. Yeah, let's let's talk. You 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 don't. This this scenario is a four and four. Um, this scenario could be. Okay. Okay. Uh, you could have. Nick's nodding. Yeah. So for the sake of time, for the sake of the camera and the video, I'm just gonna I'm gonna ignore the sidebar conversation here. Um, <clears throat> this scenario talks about pack definition, whether it's one white and three black up front and th three black and one white in the back. So it's still both teams. This is, this is the white pivot with three black or whichever, right? Um, four and four, four and four, but they're both teams on each side. If one goes down, the pack just shifted, the pack just shifted and that pivot's active. If one person slows down, sometimes it's not even two and two. Maybe my helper as my pivot is uh, eight feet behind us already. And it's like, come help, come help. But they don't hear and they slow down and they just shift it. It's not like you have to slow down and, and brace that, you know, get that 10 feet. Um, it happens and it happens quick and you may not even know what happens. That's where you have to listen to pivot active um, and go. Um, I have lots of microphones. Yeah, one more quick thing, and then I'll, I'll take a question here, is this happens with jammers. Okay, if you've got the opposing pivot in the front, and you're like, holy crap, I'm tired, or really, Carter's pivoting? <laughs> I have to race against Carter? Like, get him, right? So there's times when you may not want to break that 10 feet to, you know, to become active, or... Um, that you're, you're sitting here and what happens is pack can shift or um, a penalty can happen, which all of a sudden puts that opposing pivot out of play and you're not paying attention and you're active. Or you could be behind the pivot, right? So, ref, we're talking, uh, so I am the, the, this is, I like using Carter because he's one of my teammates now. Um, this is the opposing pivot. And I'm like, oh, crap. And I'm here as a jammer. And there's an accordion thing going behind us. All of a sudden, out of play front. I'm more than 10 feet. I am now lead. And just as quick, accordion back. Pack is all. I'm active behind a pivot or behind a blocker or behind two of them. Oh, and this person can go. Oh, you have to spin it out. I'm already active, but I'm trapped. <laughs> it happens, right? So pack definition is something to really study up with if you're going to be an inside pack ref. Um, it's super important. It's super quick. It takes up probably 50% of your bandwidth of, of, of processing everything. Um, okay, we have a question. Well, I just, I, I want to make sure I understand this right. We are using four drop down to three, right? But let's say the front pack is four and the back pack is three because of a penalty. Yeah. We lose the front. We're now three and three, but still mixed pack both. Yeah. The pack is still front. So I, I would, so, I would imagine that you really should be studying pack definition because it takes up a lot of bandwidth. You know, you're absolutely right. And in those scenarios, there, the back is three, the front is three, it's still front, right? Yep. 
Yeah. My, my point is, uh, as a jammer, as a pivot, you can become active even not trying to, and you need to be aware of that. Um, if you're ever questioning, like you heard some stuff and you're wondering, you should look at your active score ref or your score ref. Are they pointing at you? They may not still have their hand up. Are they pointing at you? See, our, our refs aren't coming to yeah, or, point out the order. pivots that quickly. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's because they have to watch the jammer in the back until the front ref goes. Like yeah. Right. <clears throat> so so here's, here's the scenario. It's really tough. Um, especially pivots. Uh, on, on accidental pivot breaks, it would go, my calling it, um, out of play, right? As soon as it shifts back, packs back, out of play, black, pivot active, right? So I'm hollering to you, but I'm hollering to my active score, my scorer ref as well, for them to know that the pivot's active to you. You don't have that scorer ref yet. Until they, where are they at? Where's the per? Oh, and then they come find you, and then they're going to be looking at you, but staying where you're at. You could say, "Am I active?" You could not. The order that that's set in, because that's come up in ours. Yeah. Do you have to say pivot break first, and then out of play, or do you? Do you yeah. yeah. Uh, so this this has came up. This is personal preference. Uh, I teach and and give my reasoning behind according to the rules. There there's there's no rule about cadence of what's said first. Um, for me, it's important to know that people are out of play. Um, first and foremost, because if I say pivot active, and there's contact or hitting because they're like, oh, forget that, you're not going. So the first thing I do is say the out of play. Because of the out of play, the pivot is active, right? So on these scenarios, I don't say out of play for two or three. It's as quick as I can. Out of play, black pivot active. Okay. Um, that is my personal preference. That's what I teach. Uh, but that doesn't mean it has to happen in that way. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it's be, right, best practices is probably a better way of saying things. But, but if you put something in the rules like this, then you're going to get official reviews of they didn't say, they didn't say pivot active before they said out of play, or they said out of play, or they, you know, and that's not legal, that gave an advantage, and no. So best practices or, hey, let's try to help everybody out ourselves, let's do it this way, right? A guidance set front. Right. Oh, I'm on non-official review of this information. <laughs> yeah. I'm supposed to ask you how to word it. <laughs> okay, uh, let's quickly talk about apex jumps. Points. I'm a jammer. I like to hop. I like to jump those apexes. Um, <clears throat> when you jump, you are in the position you were before your feet came off the ground, okay? So if I'm jumping the apex, while I'm in the air, I am still back where I, where I took off from, okay? Your uh, is where you start and where you land. Yep, if I land with one foot upright in the skating position, not even the skating position, but I'm upright, um, Am I upright? Am I in play? This is a kind of a question, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so if I'm on one foot, I'm considered inbounds, I could still block some people, right? Okay. Sure. Um, so, yep, the answer is yes. So if I jump the apex and I land on one foot, immediately that's my spot, right? And now I fall. Okay, so while I was in the air, I'm back here. I just landed, now I'm up here. Would I get the points of the people I passed or not? Yeah. Yeah. Right, yes. Yeah, right, right, because now my, I'm here. Flat on your face. Right, no. so <laughs> I've landed, I'm in place, I've got the points, I fall, okay? Now I get up and I go. Did I cut anybody? No. 
No, because you can I've already got my points. I've already landed. I've already established my position on the track. I haven't cut anybody. Okay? Uh, I'm going to get to yours. Um, okay, now I'm in the air. So a different scenario. I jump. I'm in the air. Somebody hits my hip. Okay, so now an opposing blocker's hit me. I'm still able to get my foot in first. I land and I fall. So somebody's done some work to make me fall. Uh, do I get points is the first question. Okay, so I still landed. I've still established my position. I'm still upright, right? So I've landed, I've got my points, and I've fallen. Did I cut them because they did work to make me fall and I went from behind them to in front of them? Did I cut them? No. no. You landed. If you get back. Because your position was there and then your position was here. You never in infield. All right. So I never touched outside of, out of bounds. I hovered. You didn't make the contact. Right. 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 In the scenario, right? So I, I know it's tough without like whiteboarding, but okay, great. So I get up and I go. Everything's fine. Okay. Third scenario, same situation. Uh, as beginning, I jump. I land on my hip instead of my skate, or I land on the side of my skate, right, which causes me to fall. Do I get those points? No. No, no. You didn't establish your position in a new track. You didn't finish on the track. You weren't upright. You were still on the track. You never touched okay, so, the Okay, so in this scenario, um, you're saying, so what would a call, would there be any call? No, no. Well, we're just such a your energy. If you didn't advance to and you don't have to yield, then how come you don't get the points? Because you didn't land upright? I mean, does no, it say anything? I love this. I already know the answer. I, I'm just, I'm letting you guys debate things. This is so good. Ooh. I say there's the follow-on impact of if your fall. Like, if you fall and you're cutting across, you're not going to fall skull. So now you're looking at... Okay, that's enough. Well, we can get to that, too, right? If somebody trips over you. But... But for the sake of points, for the sake of penalties on an apex jump, this happens, right? So, okay, I've jumped, I landed on the side of my skate, I've fallen in front, I get up and I go. Okay, uh, I don't get the points. Um, it's no different than if I fell and crawled past people. Uh, it's a no pass, no penalty. I didn't touch out of bounds, so I never cut them. It's a matter of, I fell behind them. Uh, for some strange reason, my skin didn't stick and go. Aah! I slid right by people and I got up and I went. Okay? So, um, no pass, no penalty, no points. You can continue on your day if you wanted to. Um, but you also can't call it off if you have a back stand. Right. Right. In that as as uh, yeah, well, hold on. But there's one more person in front of you. In, in, this, in this scenario, I mean, we, we could really get detailed and say, okay, um, was I a, a jammer or an active scorer? Does that action make me become an active scorer? Um, if there wasn't another active scorer, am I the lead active scorer? Can I get points? Um, the answer to all this is if you are a jammer and this happens, it's a no pass, no penalty, but you still emerge from the pack. You're still an active scorer. If there's no other one, you could still be the lead active scorer. You're still going to go around. You're still going to get the points. If it's a scoring pass, we just talked about, you would not get any of the points on those. Maybe you passed one and you jumped over three. You would get one point. So real fast for... In ASR, if you see your jammer on a scoring pass and they jump apex, don't land it, never go out of bounds, they have no points, they need points, there's nobody in front of them they can pass. Can they then remove themselves from the track to reset to get those points in bounds again? Because you're not supposed to leave the track. Yeah. I'm wondering if that's allowed because that's like... You have, right, and you don't want to do another lap. Well, uh, let, me, let me just say it would be safe. It depends on how you remove yourself from the pack because here, here's the deal. The, the, the flip side of this is you, you do the apex jump and your wheel goes over. Okay, now we know you're out of bounds. Sure. Everything changes, right? If somebody hits you and you land and you land out of bounds and come in, that uh, the whole scenario has changed, right? right? Um, as a jammer, do you know, like, maybe, maybe... When I, when I jumped, I went over the line, and when I landed, I fell. I'm like, oh, crap. I crawl out of bounds just to be safe, uh -huh. right? Even though now you don't have to crawl out of bounds, but I don't even want a warning called on me, so I, I could. If I'm crawling and somebody trips over me, that's a low block. 
right? So if you sprawl out, you jump and sprawl and somebody trips over you, that's a low block. Or in your hyper sprawling, you kick someone else's foot. Yep. If you kick somebody else's foot, that's a low block. If you tuck and fall small and wait for people to go around you and then go to get your points, right. perfectly oh, so fine. Just fall and stay down. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, right, okay. right. Okay. So, I would just let them all pass. Pass. Let pass me, get up and go. Lots of scenarios and lots of ways to word things and to do things differently. But, um, I guess this is a rough. Do you ever penalize somebody who resets themselves because they think they've cut track, even though a cut track guild hasn't been? So the way I look at things is, did you step out of bounds to avoid a block? No, no. no well, if you have a skate malfunction and you pull yourself out to quickly, I might shoot, my laces are untied. I'm not going to penalize you for, for stepping outside of the track momentarily, right? You're not gaining an advantage. You're not... If you volunteer. Right, right. Okay. Right. Um... Can you kind of explain the whole, if we land on somebody? So the apex mm -hmm. jump, when is it a penalty versus not a penalty? Okay, great. Um, you get a misconduct. Um, sorry, I was misconduct. I, I was thinking like, it's not insub, it's not insub, what is it? misconduct. If you have both feet off the ground, you don't have to be doing an apex jump. You could be trying to jump through a line, right? Jump through a wall of some sort. Uh, if you initiate the contact with both feet off, your, off the ground, you're going to get a misconduct. Whether you need to fall on them or not. Yeah. Still in so where this comes in with apex jumps, um, you are jumping into somebody, you're going to get that penalty. You are still a legal target for them. So if you jump both feet off the ground, and they hit you, that's perfectly legal as long as they are in bounds, in play, yeah, part of the pack. Yeah. So if, they've, if, 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 if you have an established position right where they're going and they hit you, that's a penalty on them. I'm, I'm, on, I'm in lane one and a half. She if sees jumps the apex, I step into one, she hits me, same as the back block, I'm, so, I'm just off. She moved her no, 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 no. She already had I know. I know exactly where this is going, right? But what I'm going to tell you is apex jumps happen. You can read them sometimes. The ability to get there and establish a position before they land, like once you see them in the air, to quickly, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch you up to you faster than you jumping is tough. If you were to be able to plant, establish a position where they're going and they hit you, that's a penalty on them. But you weren't there when they took off. It doesn't matter. Okay. Listen, which... right. Yeah. If <laughs> it's more likely what's going to happen is the act of you trying to get to that position is causing you to initiate the block against them, yeah. which could hit them out of bounds. Who knows? So it's very technically... That is a penalty in so that's why I was... Yeah, technically, you could do it. It's very tough to do. More likely, you're going to initiate on the person jumping the apex. When you're making your step. Okay, so yeah. if they jump and the pack is just going around and they land on somebody, even though the pack was here, they jump, but the pack naturally came around, they landed on somebody, that's still a penalty on them. Yeah, if, right? if, if they make the contact with both feet off the ground, yes. So... Uh, the, the, the flip was before if they make contact. Yeah, the flip side of that is I come down. So I'm sorry. I don't know. Are you good? Do I need? I, I, okay. I didn't know if I need to repeat all these things. Nope. Um, if I'm in the air, you jump in my trajectory. You're so fast. You get there. You plant your position. I can still, if I get one foot on the ground inbounds before I hit you, then it all goes back to legal target zones, legal blocking zones, impact there, right? So I could still land, maybe hit right outside the bra straps. Even if it's with my chest, this is a legal blocking zone, and I could take you down, right? Because I have so much force, momentum, I hit a legal target zone, you fall, I continue on, and you're like, they just, she was in the air, they were in the air, and their feet, well, no, they, they lucky, they, whoop, 
Oh, they got that. They touched. Yeah. Thank you. So as a blocker, just don't let them touch the ground. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, as a blocker, if you're reading that jump, right? And you can even be looking this way. You, you see what's happening. Oh, yeah. I see it coming, right? You know, don't attack with your hip. Don't attack with your butt because this leg goes right over top, right? Get your shoulder out there. Get it over the line, right? You're the one trying to hit them before they can make it in. Oh, it's all good. Yeah. Real quick, Wagner, can you uh, can you explain the apex jump scenarios when they uh, they jump, they don't hit anybody, the first foot lands in bounds, and the second skate lands out of bounds. Okay. Um, it's not going to get called this way all the time. I mean, you already I already know it, right? So. If the first foot touches in, I am now, we've already, we've already talked through this. I am in that spot. The next foot goes out of bounds. Okay, well, did I cut anybody? If somebody hit me during the jump, maybe their motion caused that. I still got the points. But if, if I hit a skater and five feet forward from me, they go out of bounds because I really launched them. Right? They can't just come back in. They have, to, they have to be able to deal. That would be a cut. So in some scenarios we've talked about, I get the points. I got hit. So in this scenario, I got hit. I get the points. I step out here. If I come back in, color, number, cut, yield. So no whistle for refs. It's a cut. I'm, I'm sorry? They hit you. They continue forward and you still come back in behind them. And then it's always yeah, then, then, it's, then it's not a cut, right? Then if, so same scenario, we talked about the first one, I jump, no one touches me, I touch, okay, I'm in, I touch, I'm out. Um, can I come back in, did I cut anybody? I didn't cut anybody. Um, you may, because you had one foot over the line on an apex, you may get a infield violation that you just cut the track shorter as you're going around. And if you do that again, you could get a penalty. Um, everybody familiar with in-track violation? All right. If as a jammer you're going around the track, uh, one wheel, two wheels, one foot goes over that inside line of the apex, um, you will get a warning. If it happens a second time during that jam, you're going to get a penalty. Okay. If both feet go over that inside line and you continue around, you will get a penalty. So there's no warning really about that. Yeah. What time are we going to? What? There's a scrimmage at. 11:30. Uh... 11:30. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I'm going to be here for a little bit. So find me if you have just individual questions. I'm happy to answer answer different things. So, thank you. Thank you.